sequels are very rarely better than the original. This is the case in the film industry as well as the gaming industry. It's very rare that a sequel to a legendary game ends up being better than the original title that everyone holds in such high regard. I would say the only real exception to this rule may be Resident Evil, where many people consider Resident Evil 2 to be superior to Resident Evil 1. I suppose Assassin's Creed is another one where Assassin's Creed 2 is considered superior to Assassin's Creed 1. And Batman Arkham City is also actually considered superior to Batman Arkham Asylum. And ironically, all three of these games I've covered on the channel in the past. Dark Souls is a bit different though, because Dark Souls is already in many ways a sequel to Demon Souls, even if it was never branded or promoted as such. Anyone who has played both games know that Dark Souls feels like a sequel in terms of how the game feels and plays. The game's themes, character similarities, the combat pacing, stamina management. And the game was originally built to be a sequel, but because of copyright issues with Sony, it couldn't be. So Dark Souls is in essence Demon's Souls 2, which would then make Dark Souls 2 the third entry in this franchise. The original Dark Souls was such a phenomenal game, and it already overcame many of the problems that a sequel tends to run into, such as revisiting old concepts, paying constant homage to the past, and not forging its own path and identity, while still managing to retain the essence of what made the original game so good. So, I don't think many people were really very worried about Dark Souls 2. After all, the original Dark Souls was such an amazing successor to Demon Souls, and Dark Souls 2 seemed to be doing a similar thing by being set in an entirely different land, featuring a completely new cast of characters, and telling a very separate story, this time focusing on memory and confusion and the passing of time. Yet the problems with Dark Souls 2, though, are rooted in the very foundations of the game. And in this video, we'll be diving deep into them, but we first need to start with the game's notoriously troubled development. Dark Souls 2 is infamous for having a very troubled development process. For the first half of the game's development, the director was Tomohiro Shibuya. However, this changed partway through the game's development when Yui Tenomura took over, and the entire game suddenly changed. And then, the Dark Souls 2 that we have today was essentially cobbled together from various pieces of finished levels, and then a few areas were added to that after the fact. Yui Tenomura says, this game actually went through quite a troubled development process. Due to a number of factors, we were actually forced to rethink the entire game midway into development. We had to decide what to do with the designs and maps that had been created up to that point. Ideally, we'd start again from scratch, but of course, we were under time constraints, so instead we had to figure out how to repurpose the designs in our newly reimagined game. This meant everything from deciding new roles for characters to finding ways to slot locations into the world map. So basically this means Yui Tanamura had to take characters and areas that were created by other people and try and form some kind of cohesive narrative, build character quests and motivations, and form a story for the entire game that manages to connect all these areas and sadly, I think you can sort of tell when you play the game. Once Dark Souls 2 had been released, the DLC that was created for the game was actually created entirely under Yui Tenomura's direction. And again, I think you can tell this. You really can see those areas had a smooth development and were built with a purpose. And the director had a vision and the team successfully executed upon that vision. If the team over at From Software had instead been given more time, they would have then been able to scrap the version of Dark Souls 2 that made up to that point and create a new game under Tenomura's design, which would have probably been a much better product than what we ended up with. But sadly, too much work had been done and there was not enough time to fully make what they wanted to. However, many people feel like Dark Souls 2 is still a very good game. It might be very different to other entries in the series, but it is still beloved by many. So, in this video, I'm going to be examining and analysing Dark Souls 2 in extreme detail, going through every single area and every aspect of the game. Was Dark Souls 2 a strong sequel, or was it an inferior successor to the legendary original game?
When you start a new game, you will see the introductory cutscene, which is a cutscene that many people criticize quite a bit because instead of introducing you to the world and the new enemies that you're going to be fighting and telling you the story of what you're going to be doing and why you're doing what you're doing, it sort of gives your character a strange bit of backstory by making it seem like you had a family and then you're pulled into some strange tornado and taken away and you've forgotten what it is you're doing and you've lost your memory. It's different. It doesn't set up the story, which I think is the main thing people criticize it for. I don't mind the idea of you forgetting what you're doing and being taken to this tornado. I don't mind that at all because it does play into the game's narrative and themes of forgetting and time passing and all this kind of stuff. But I would have liked to have seen a bit more of the world building. I think that's the main criticism for me. And then after this, you aren't taken to a character creation screen, which you are in pretty much every other game. Instead, you start playing as your character. And you can't see your character's face, but the problem, another problem with this game is that you can still tell that your character is male. A lot of people in Dark Souls games really like to roleplay and feel and make their character and believe they are their character, which is why I think character creation right at the start is a very important aspect of these games because of that. And I think because people couldn't create their own character in Sekiro, it's one of the issues that people have with Sekiro. So here, you are automatically playing as a character that is supposed to be sort of, you can't see who they are, but you can tell they're a man straight away. And I usually play as a female character straight away um, when I play any Souls game. So that was immediately a bit of a strange thing for me. Then you go through the area, things betwixt, and you move forward. Uh, there's some very enemies that can't really do much damage to you they try and run away from you and then you cross a bridge and you go to this little area where the fire keepers uh, are and it's called the fire keepers dwelling and there's about five very old fire keepers sitting around a table by a fireplace immediately they start criticizing you and saying you're going to forget who you are you're going to die again and again you're going to die some more and you're going to lose all your souls all of them you'll get to drang lake and won't even remember why you're there and i think this is another red flag right when you play this game that there's something different about this game this game clearly isn't made by the same people who made the first game and when you when you read the design works interviews it is clear that there were people who made this game that didn't work on the original dark souls and it's sort of like the tone that the game is going for is very different here. The original Dark Souls was difficult, but that wasn't the point. It was a hostile world, yes, but it was difficult but fair. The enemies were placed in certain ways where the developers wanted you to succeed. They wanted you to overcome challenges and be very satisfied when you do. Dark Souls 2 doesn't take that approach. Dark Souls 2 almost feels toxic when the developers are deliberately taking the mickey out of you a lot of the time doing things just to annoy you and they're making it hard for the sake of being hard which i think is evident right here this is almost like the developers telling you that that's what they're going for here they're going for a game that's hard for the sake of being hard, not hard but fair, which is a different approach. And I think anybody that's played Dark Souls 2 for a considerable period of time and played it like I have for these videos, played it straight after playing Demon Souls and Dark Souls, there's a massive difference, especially in some of the later areas of the game. It's not as bad at the beginning, the Forest of Fallen Giants and Hyde's Tower of Flame. Those areas are not as bad. But then when you start getting later into the game, that's when things start to feel not right. And you can tell that it's not made by the same team. And I think for many people, when they first play Dark Souls 2, this cutscene right here with these fire keepers was a big red flag right from the start. So this is something that I didn't like. And then after these uh, old fire keepers talk to you that's when you get to create your character and then after here you go through a little area where there's some optional tutorials that you can do which you can choose to do that just introduce the basics of the game i don't mind this it's done in a different way to dark souls one because it's optional and you can run past it if you want to which i appreciate 
and get straight to Medulla. But often, I'll go through this just to get a few extra souls and a few extra random items. This area is not bad. It's good for beginners, but I think an issue with it is that it's not in your face. Straight away, right there from the get-go. And I know this isn't what was originally planned. Originally, it was planned that in Things Betwixt there would be a big dragon, and you had to try and find a way to get past the dragon or defeat the dragon in some way. So I assume the tutorial was originally going to be very different as well. It sounds more like the Northern Undead Asylum from Dark Souls 1, where maybe the dragon was going to be the tutorial boss, and you had to sort of... Originally, you died to it, maybe, or you had an initial encounter with it, and you had to try and find a way to defeat it by getting your items and things. I assume that's probably what the original intention was, but then it was changed. This, which I don't mind, but like I said, it, it could perhaps be easy for newcomers to miss this tutorial because it is to the side and it is optional and it's not right in your face at the start like it is in the original Dark Souls and Demon Souls. Then we get to Medulla. Medulla is the Firelink Shrine of Dark Souls 2. It is, I think, one of Dark Souls 2's just best moments when you come out of things betwixt and see Medulla and it looks absolutely beautiful. It's gorgeous. You have a lovely bit of music. The Emerald Herald is standing there with a hood blowing in the wind and a cloak blowing in the wind. And you're by the sea and it just is beautiful. It's an amazing area. I would love to be in that area in real life. It looks absolutely gorgeous and it's a massive different difference from anything in Dark Souls 1. There was nothing in the original Dark Souls that looked this good. Anna Londo was close, but it doesn't have that kind of serene, peaceful, tranquil beauty that Medulla does. And I absolutely love this area. And it's my favorite hub area in the entire Souls series. Even more than the original Firelink Shrine. And I do love Firelink Shrine, but Medulla, there's just something great about it that I really love. And at the start, you have a blacksmith who is outside of his shop and you need to try and find a key to allow you access to the blacksmith. There is a cat which you can buy some rings from. And there is another vendor who sells armor and shields and weapons and things. You probably at this point, you won't really have many souls. You won't really be able to buy much. But Medulla is that connecting area that connects to all the different areas of the game. And so you'll be revisiting here a lot. Now, I'm not going to talk much about the Emerald Herald currently. I'll speak more about her in the next section. But her dialogue sets you up with the story and tells you initially where to go. And so does the crestfallen warrior who makes his return from Demon Souls and Dark Souls 1. He also gives you tips and tells you the initial ways to go. Because from Medulla, there are multiple paths, which is something I really like. And Dark Souls 2 sort of has, it has a couple of different paths you can progress on at the beginning of the game which i really do appreciate it's a a lot better than dark souls 3 which would take a more linear approach and i do like having that freedom which is something that dark souls 2 does retain from dark souls 1 is that sense of freedom where you can go wherever you want to go in dark souls 1 at the start you can go to new londo ruins where you can go to blight town where you can go to undead parish you can go to Undead Berg, you can go to loads of different, you can go to the Catacombs, Tomb of the Giants, you can go to all these places right from the start when you originally reach a Firelink Shrine. Dark Souls 2 is a little bit more limited, but there still is loads of different ways because you can go to Forest of Fallen Giants, which can then take you to the Lost Bastille, or you can go to Hyde's Tower of Flame, which can then take you to No Man's Wolf, which can then take you to the Lost Bastille. Or then, after you've got a fragrant branch of yore, you can go to the Shaded Woods, which can then take you to Harvest Valley and Earthen Peak and Iron Keep and all these places. So, you do have a lot of freedom, which I like. And it does mean that re when you replay this game, you have a lot of freedom. You can change how you approach things and you can do things a little bit differently on repeated playthroughs, which I really do appreciate. So, Medulla is one of Dark Souls 2's best-looking visuals. And it works really well from a gameplay perspective as well. There's one covenant here called the Covenant of Champions, which you really don't want to join if you're new to this game and you're just playing the game because it makes the game harder. I think it makes the enemies deal more damage to you, uh, twice as much damage, or it might 
mean that you do less damage to them. It's one of them. I can't quite remember. But it's good having that option from the start. And you can also join the Covenant or the Way of Blue uh, from the Crestfallen Warrior. Which means that you can get help from other people who join a different Covenant. They can come and help you if you get invaded. Which is very good. And Bajula is generally, like I said, one of Dark Souls 2's best moments. And it's very good. It serves a great purpose. And I really do like it. So then, leveling and statistics was changed as well in Dark Souls 2. First of all, I'm going to cover the statistics. So, Vigor is a new statistic added in. This is now what increases your health and your hit points, but it also increases your petrify resistance, which is a new ailment in the game where you can get petrified by certain creatures. Endurance is the same as it was in Dark Souls 1. It increases your stamina, your physical defense, and poise. Vitality now, which is what increased your HP before your health points, now it doesn't do that. It increases your equipment load instead. It also increases your physical defense and your poison resistance. Then there is attunement. Attunement works exactly the same as in Dark Souls 1. It is the amount of spells that can be attuned and the number of casts you can have per each spell. It now does that, so it changes how many times you can cast each spell, whereas in Dark Souls 1 it was just how many spells you can have attuned at once. But here it also increases your spell casting speed as well as your agility and curse resistance. Strength is the same as Dark Souls 1 as well. It is your main attribute if you want to be using heavier weapons, heavy armor, big shields. It increases the damage you do with any weapons that scale with strength. It also boosts your physical defense as well. Dexterity works the same as Dark Souls 1 as well, where it's about that's your main statistic for faster weapons, and it increases the damage you do with dexterity scaling weapons, but it also boosts your poison and bleed attack bonus as well as your physical defense. Adaptability is a new statistic. This is the main one. So adaptability is uh, your agility essentially and it, in, the more adaptability you have the higher your invincibility frames when you roll so when you roll to dodge an attack in dark souls you have certain frames when you are invincible and that means that you can dodge through any enemy attack and you won't take any damage in dark souls 2 that is much lower than in dark souls 1 and demon souls you have way less invincibility frames when you roll they're also known as iframes which I will call them from now on. So these iframes, as you level up adaptability, you get more iframes, which means that the game also doesn't feel very consistent because when you start off the game, there's no point rolling because you just have so little adaptability that there's no point doing it. But then when you get higher and higher and higher, you get way more iframes. So suddenly you can roll through much bigger attacks and things. Uh, adaptability also increases all resistances and it boosts your poison bonus and poise it also is related to how fast you use items and there's a ma this is a massive change to dark as a whole and it negatively affects the overall balance of the game and it's probably why some enemies in dark souls 2 have bigger hitboxes because they're trying to compensate for the fact that some people could have lower iframes if they don't realize how important adaptability is and some people can have much higher iframes so therefore they make enemies' hitboxes much bigger when they deal damage to sort of compensate for this. Intelligence works the same as Dark Souls 1, but it also is now your attribute required for both sorceries as well as hexes, which are a new type of sorcery in this game. It also boosts your magic, fire, and dark attack and defense. And it also slightly boosts your casting speed. Faith also is the same as before. It is an attribute required for miracles, but it also is required for hexes as well. This boosts your lightning, fire, and dark attack and defense, and it also slightly boosts casting speed, bleed bonus, and bleed resist. Now, Dark Souls 2 also changed the leveling curve of the game, which is something people don't really talk about as much. So, Hidetaka Miyazaki, the director of Demon Souls, Dark Souls 1, Bloodborne, Dark Souls 3, Sekiro, Elden Ring, he generally builds his games all to have a similar leveling curve, which means that by the end of a playthrough of Demon Souls, Dark Souls 1, Bloodborne, or Dark Souls 3, you are generally around level 80. 
maybe it's a bit lower or a bit higher depending on if you've done farming or you rush through the game but it's generally 80. now in dark souls 2 you're about level 150 when you finish dark souls 2 which is a massive difference but because of this it means that leveling isn't really as satisfying because each level doesn't feel like it's worth as much and it's just a small thing but it does feel like it has quite a major impact on the gameplay when you level up though you don't level up at a bonfire like you did in dark souls 1 in dark souls 1 you'd go to a bonfire any bonfire and you could level up from there now you level up using the emerald herald similar to in demon souls when you would go to the maiden in black the Emerald Herald is a character you encounter when you first arrive in Medulla. It's a return to the Demon Soul system when you go to that specific character instead of leveling up bonfires in this system, but then continue to be used in every single game until Elden Ring. In Elden Ring, they made a compromise by having the character that allows you to level up teleport to you when you go to a site of grace, which is that game's version of bonfires. It's a good compromise, and I wish they'd sort of thought of that earlier. Now, Another new addition to Dark Souls 2's sort of leveling system is Soul Memory. Now, Soul Memory is quite confusing, but it's basically the total amount of all souls gathered on a character. In this game, it's part of the formula that allows you to be matched with different people online that have a similar soul memory. So... If you want to play with others, you need to be within a certain soul memory range. If you have higher soul level characters, they can be paired with lower level characters who have similar soul memory ranges. So even if you're really high level, you can be paired with someone who's a low level if you have a similar soul memory. So basically, any soul items and boss souls that you pick up are added to your soul memory. But only when you use them, not when you actually gain them so if you have items or boss souls you're not gained you don't gain the souls unless you actually use the items and they're added to your souls at the bottom right of the screen so any souls that are added to that bottom right counter on your screen they are added to your total soul memory and that means you can be matched with someone else so you could literally go through the game and just run past to every enemy not get very many souls and you'd have a low soul memory even though you've done quite a bit of the game which means you can be matched with someone else who has lower soul memory it's quite confusing it's a confusing system and you can check your soul memory though on the status screen it's the top right hand number and the interesting thing is if you pick up souls from your bloodstain after you've died it doesn't add it to your soul memory but if any souls are lost upon dying a second time, so if you die, you leave a bloodstain, and then you die again without touching that bloodstain, it still counts towards your soul memory. So it's always better to recover your souls on the bloodstain if you don't want to get underleveled. It's a confusing system. It never returned again. And the interesting thing is that when, when Hidetaka Miyazaki was asked when he was developing dark souls 3 someone asked him um they said to him is soul memory going to return in dark souls 3 hide taka miyazaki didn't even know what soul memory was so he was never even aware of this mechanic to begin with and i assume he must have played dark souls 2 in some way because he was a supervisor for the game he didn't even know what soul memory was so it's quite interesting really but yes this mechanic has never returned again in any souls game afterwards it, it was an interesting idea and an interesting experiment to try and sort of change the way players are matched with each other and to stop people who are like who are soul level one but really good at the game invading a new player even though they're really good got loads of strong gear it was a way to sort of try and stop that but it didn't really work out very well the system was criticized very heavily and has never come back again So now we've talked about all that, we're going to move on to the Forest of Fallen Giants, continuing on, pushing forward. The Forest of Fallen Giants is for many people the best area in Dark Souls 2, and I probably would agree. It's like the Undead Burg and the Undead Parish of Dark Souls 1, all mashed into one area called the Forest of Fallen Giants. It has two bosses, 
It's a very extensive area. There's lots of characters, lots of things to do here. And it's going to be quite difficult to try and remember it all. So, uh, first of all, you go down the, the lower path from Medulla. And there's a big giant there on your right. One of these big giants who's very stupid. got stupid hitboxes. I tend to ignore this guy because he's just frustrating. You push forward. There's a bonfire. Which, okay, it's a bit close to the Medulla bonfire. But it's one to get your foot in the area. And then you push forward. There's, you get your first ambush then in the Forest of Fallen Giants. There's a hollow in front of you. And then another one comes up behind you. And they were lying on the floor. Then they stand up and come up behind you. It... It again sets that precedent of Dark Souls 2 where it has lots of ambushes and lots of things that feel quite unfair to the player and quite frustrating. But this isn't too bad here and Forest of Fallen Giants doesn't really have that too much. When you get to the top of the ladder up there, there is a big area where there's loads of just hollows lying on the floor. They look like they've all, they're all dead and they're corpses. But then when you get close to them, they come up and you can potentially get about 10 hollows maybe even 12 hollows all attacking you at once so the key is to slowly aggro them one at a time or as slow as possible and try and take them all out and then from there you get to push forward to the forest of fallen giants proper which is the main indoor area of the level it's called a forest of fallen giants but you spend most of the area indoors it's quite strange right? it doesn't really feel like a forest so then you get to that main building from the main building, you go down a ladder. If you jump down where this ladder is, there's, there's a bonfire. If you jump down where the ladder is next to the bonfire, you take full damage. Even though in Dark Souls 1, you wouldn't take much full damage from that. But in Dark Souls 2, it can literally kill you. Here we get to the best part of the area, I think. Which is when you go outdoors, you go up, like climb up a bit of a, a branch. You encounter one of these enemies that's like a turtle shell. It's a way to try and teach the player not to go for backstabs like they did in Dark Souls 1 because in Dark Souls 1 you could abuse backstabs you could circle around enemies and try and get a backstab on them very easily this enemy here is designed to deliberately counter that to stop the player from going for that because in Dark Souls 2 you don't really want to do that because backstabs are much harder to get so these enemies they'll literally fall backwards onto you with their turtle shield and deal a lot of damage if you try and go for a backstab on them so that's what these enemies are there for then there's a little area, if you climb up on the right, where you can encounter the Pursuer. This is an encounter where you have one chance at it. He's a very strong enemy. He's a boss of this area, but you can fight him optionally here. If he kills you once, or if he leaves for some reason, he'll never come back again in this area. You have one chance. And if you defeat him, you don't really get much, but it's good experience for the boss fight. And you get a few souls, which is good. There's some interesting items up here, but then we get our first shortcut. This is a very good shortcut. I love this shortcut. If you throw a firebomb at some barrels here, they explode, and then it opens a shortcut back to the bonfire you were at earlier. You haven't really done too much of the level, but it's enough where it's very satisfying to open that shortcut. And it, the problem with it, though, is that it makes the player think, oh, yes, Dark Souls 2 is going to have some great shortcuts like Dark Souls 1. It doesn't, but... So that's the unfortunate thing with that. There's a couple of shortcuts in the game, but none of them are very good. None of them make you go, oh, that connects to there. Like in Dark Souls 1, when you go down to the lower undead parish or the lower undead burg, and you go back through the sewer tunnel, the aqueduct, which connects back to Firelink Shrine, and you're like, whoa, that connects to that area. That's awesome. But no, there's nothing like that in Dark Souls 2. Anyway... Pushing forward more, we go down and we encounter a character called Pate. Pate is like this game's version of Patches. He has a storyline with someone else. These two people almost like have a feud going on. He encourages you to try and go through um, a gate and then he closes the gate behind you to trick you. He's... I don't understand why they didn't use the same voice actor for Patches. Because Patches was in Demon Souls, Dark Souls 1. He's in Dark Souls 3, Bloodborne, Elden Ring... He's a recurring character in these games. I don't know why they didn't bring him back for Dark Souls 2, but they tried something different. Maybe the voice actor wasn't available. I don't know. But if he closes the gate on you, you can fight through some enemies and come back around and then drop down, and he's gone, if I remember rightly. He's not there anymore. And this is your first encounter with him. We'll, we'll encounter him more later. He returns later, and there's a whole quest with him where he has his battle with someone else. Continuing through this area then, uh, you then come back round to the opposite side of a gate that we saw earlier, which you can unlock. 
And then from here, you have a very short and quick way to get to the boss fight of the area, which is the last giant. The last giant is, I think of him as the Taurus demon of this game. He's easy. He's very simple. There's not really too much to him. You can kill him very simply, just hack at his ankles. A lot of the time I defeat him without getting hit. Even on my first time playing Dark Souls 2, he was very easy. And I'm pretty sure I killed him on my second or third go uh, when I first played Dark Souls 2. So he's not that difficult at all. And then when you defeat him, you get a key, a uh, soldier key. And the lore to the last giant is a bit more interesting than anything else. It's when you look into the, the lore aspect and the story aspect of it, it's a bit more interesting, but it's never really that compelling of an encounter. And I think they could have done something a bit better. I mean, the Taurus demon was very easy in Dark Souls 1, but the last giant I think is even easier. And I, I would like the last giant to be at least have, have a, I'd say at least have like an extra half his health, like 150% health. Something like that, maybe even 200% health, maybe double his health, but 150% health would be good. Then you get, like I said, the soldier key, which allows you to access some other doors that you couldn't open earlier. Using one of these doors, you climb up some stairs, and then you get another boss site, which is the pursuer, the same enemy we saw earlier. The problem with this encounter with the pursuer is, the pursuer would be a great fight, a fantastic way to start like properly upping the difficulty of this game. To teach you to actually master the enemy's moves, really understand what that boss is going for, you know, go around and deal a lot of damage, maybe even teach the, the player to parry him. It'd be great, it'd be, I think that'd be, a, that's a great time as well to start really up in the difficulty of bosses. You've had your easy boss, now this is your more difficult one, and it's optional as well. So the player can very easily go a different path if they want to, and not have to fight him, because he's a completely optional boss. But the problem is that you get they have these like ballistas in the room and you use them and you can just kill the pursuer in two shots with these ballistas what's the point having a boss if you're just gonna have that level of cheese like i understand cheesing a boss okay like you got you got the ceaseless discharge in dark souls one right where it's more about story and narrative so you don't really want it to be that that difficult and then in Dark Souls 3, you've got the Ancient Wyvern, but that's more about like how awesome it looks and, you know, scenic. It just looks awesome. But then here it's like, you know, you just walk in, there's a ballista there, you know, bait him to go in front of it, then shoot him twice. It's just, it's not even a good cheese where it's like got some lore narrative or something, or, you know, it makes it more tragic, like Ceaseless Discharge. Or, you know, it's about having that awesome image of you plunging down, doing a plunging attack on the top of the ancient wyvern in Dark Souls 3, where it just looks really cool. And, you know, the run up there is, like, epic. You've got to try and dodge this dragon's attacks. Here, it's just, no, no, you just roll. Bait him to get in front of the ballista, then bam, bam, he's defeated. It's just disappointing, really. Anyway then, on to Hyde's Tower of Flame. Hyde's Tower of Flame slash the Cathedral of Blue. We'll be covering both these aspects in this one section. So Hyde's Tower of Flame is the other path you can go if you don't do the Forest of Fallen Giants first. Because after the Forest of Fallen Giants, there is a way to progress to a different area. Instead, we're going to go back and do Hyde's Tower of Flame. So here, this is more like an Anor Londo, visually. And you have these big slow moving giants which are very similar to the Anolondo giants from Dark Souls 1 and even visually and aesthetically it looks a bit like Anolondo it feels like maybe this is like the ruins of Anolondo or this was built on top of Anolondo or built from what was left of Anolondo that's what it feels like and you have similar enemies here as well and it's like crumbling pathways and walkways in development this was originally supposed to just be a bridge a connecting area to connect from one like Medulla to connect to No Man's Wharf. But it ended up being built upon and built upon and made bigger and bigger until it became its own area, which is pretty interesting. It's pretty cool. I'm glad that they did that. And Hyde's Tower of Flame, I think the problem with Hyde's Tower of Flame is the Hyde Knights. Now, I've only ever played the Scholar of the First Sin version of this game. So I couldn't tell you if the Hyde Knights were originally all here. But the big soldiers 
up and fit you fine. They are they are in abundance. There's quite a few of them, but they are a fair fight. But if you pair them with the high knights, if they're both attacking you at once, it's complete bullshit. It's just completely stupid. It suddenly changed the difficulty from easy to brutally hard, which is the problem I had because I just went past the the soldiers, I defeated the soldiers, took the right path, went to the dragon rider boss fight, which we'll talk about in a second. And once you've defeated the dragon rider, all of the hide knights suddenly start attacking you. All of them suddenly, if you get close to them, they'll all immediately come and attack you. Because before that, they're just sitting down. They sit down, and they're sitting there, they stay there unless you challenge them. Unless you go up to them to attack them, because you want to take on that additional challenge. But once the dragon rider is defeated, suddenly all of them immediately, when you get close to them, immediately attack you. And their AI is linked to the knights. So if you start attacking one of the knights, one of the hide knights will also start attacking you as well. So it's just, oh man, when I say not, the big knights, if you attack one of the big knights, then the hide knights will come attacking you as well. It's very frustrating because it's not like Ornstein and Smo, where those two enemies there, their movesets deliberately complement each other. So, But you still have a good amount of time to get your attacks in between both of their attacks and movesets. They're, the hide knights and the big giant soldiers, they... Their attacks do not complement each other at all, and it's an absolute pain. Especially when you've got to fight, like, two of the big soldiers and two of the high knights at the same time. It's just frustrating, and it's stupid as well, because the high knights were originally almost like this game's version of the black knights, where they placed the high knights in various sections of the game in interesting places, so you could, ch you could choose to take them on. You could choose to fight them. And it was literally like an optional black and knight, so there would be an extra challenge if you wanted to take that extra challenge on. And if you did it and defeated them, you would get cool rewards. It's a really Dark Souls thing to do. It was done loads in Dark Souls 1, even in Demon Souls with the red-eyed knights, where you could do those extra challenges to get more rewards. Dark Souls 2 then removed that in Scholar of the First Sin by just moving all the high knights to highest tower of flame. And just not having them be all over the place as optional challenges. And instead just all in Heights Tower of Flame. Which is very silly. I do not understand why they changed that. I think it was a really cool idea. And I would love to know why they changed it and whose decision it was. But anyway. Uh, the Dragon Rider then is one of the boss fights for Hides Tower of Flame. Uh, you can really easily cheese him by tricking him into falling into the water because if you don't raise certain platforms, the the boss arena is really small and it's, it's easy for you to fall off, but you can trick him into falling off if you roll in a certain way. But if you raise all the platforms, he's a decent fight. He's very easy. He's a very, very simple encounter because he's designed to potentially be your first boss. If you choose to do Hyde's Tower of Flame before Forest of Fallen Giants, he can be the first boss. So he's very simple, he's not too hard, but his moves are pretty interesting. You can just circle around him and take out pretty easily, but he is a cool visual and a decent fight. He's, again, if he had more health, was a bit faster, he could have been a very cool encounter. But again, he was supposed to be potentially the first boss, so you, you can allow it. If you take the left path, then, instead of the right path through Hyde's Tower of Flame, you reach the Cathedral of Blue, where you find Old Dragon Slayer. This guy is Ornstein, basically. I think in the lore he's supposed to be an imposter. He's supposed to be someone who is wearing Ornstein's outfit deliberately to pretend to be him, or with another Dragon Slayer instead. Um, so he's not the real Ornstein, but he's supposed to look like Ornstein. And I think in Dark Souls 2, he was supposed to be Ornstein. When they made Dark Souls 2, I think he was supposed to be Ornstein, but Dark Souls 3 changed the story. So I like to think of Dark Souls 2 and 3 as separate sequels. Dark Souls 2 is like one universe, where this is a sequel to Dark Souls 1 in this universe. And Dark Souls 3 is a sequel to Dark Souls 1 in another universe. And they're different universes where different things happened, almost like different timelines. I think in Dark Souls 2's timeline, it is supposed to be Ornstein, the real Ornstein. And the one in Anolondo in Dark Souls 1 was a fake illusion created by Gwendolyn. They see that I like that story, I like that idea. And then this is the real Ornstein. Now you're fighting the real one thousands of years later. I like that idea. It's it 
it fits very well and it's a good bit of fan service. Not like Dark Souls 3 where it goes overboard with fan service. It's good fan service which expands on the original storyline but not too much. It doesn't feel like it's doing it deliberately just to make you feel all nostalgic. It's doing it because this is this new land and it just happened that he would be here. It feels more natural, like a natural way of doing it. Whereas Dark Souls 3 didn't really. But I'm going on a massive tangent. All Seeds a great fight, and in this game, Old Dragon Slayer is a great fight as well. He's a very cool, he's a very good fight. Some of his attacks are, are pretty fun to dodge, and, and it's fun to master this fight. But he's not too hard, again, because, again, he could be your first boss, depending on how you play Dark Souls 2. So, he's not too hard, doesn't have too much health, but it's a pretty fun encounter nonetheless. We're going to move on to the combat and movement of Dark Souls 2 because this is a section that I really... I've done a lot of research into this because when I first played Dark Souls 2, something fell off and I couldn't quite figure out what it was. And then I did a lot of research. I did a lot of testing. I did a lot of comparison between Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 2 and Dark Souls 3. To figure out what it was that made Dark Souls 2 feel so different. And it's a lot of different factors that all come together to make the combat feel so strange in Dark Souls 2. And the movement feel so strange. So, this is a list of all of the different factors which sort of um, play into making Dark Souls 2 feel inferior to other games. First of all... There is a massive stamina delay after you execute actions. So whenever you attack, uh, if you use up all your stamina, there's a massive delay before it even starts regenerating. When it regenerates, when it actually starts to regenerate, it regenerates fast. But the delay between when you run out of stamina and use it, and then when it regenerates, that delay is about twice as long as Dark Souls 1. It's a massive difference. Then also movement in general is slower. Your character moves slower than in other games. Attacks take longer. Rolls take longer. Everything is slower. When you walk, you walk slower. You run, you run slower. When you sprint, you sprint slower. Everything is slower in Dark Souls 2. Additionally, after you commit to an action, like an attack, there is a massive delay before you can roll or do anything. Whereas in Dark Souls 1, there is no real delay. So... For example, if you attack an enemy and then try and quickly dodge out the way for if he does a follow-up attack. So you attack and then you try and dodge. You have to attack, wait a second, and then you can roll away. And that makes the whole game, it changes everything. Because Dark Souls is about those really fast, quick actions, quick reaction times. You've got to quickly try and dodge an enemy's attack. And sometimes things can be down to the frames. Literally, if you dodge a frame earlier, it can mean you take damage. Or if you dodge a frame later, it can mean you take damage. Everything is is like that in Dark Souls. And in Dark Souls 1, you attack, and then literally the second your animation for the attack is finished, you can roll. But in Dark Souls 2, you have to attack, wait for the animation to finish, then wait for your character to sort of return to his normal standing position, then you can roll to dodge. This slows everything down. And there's a massive delay before your character basically executes any action in Dark Souls 2. Additionally, if you press the button to use an item, it doesn't queue up that action like it does in Dark Souls 3 or Elden Ring or Bloodborne. Usually, if you're attacking and then you press the button to use an item like an Estus Flask, it will queue up that action so that once your character is finished committing the attack, then it will use the item. In Dark Souls 2, that doesn't happen. So literally, if you want to heal after attacking, after attack, spam the, the, the button to use your essence flask. Just spam it. Press, 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 press. And then hope that you manage to press it after your character technically finished the attack. Because if you press it before your character technically finished the attack, your character just won't do anything. They just won't use the item. On top of this, the hitboxes of enemies are really bad in this game. So sometimes you can roll to dodge an attack, but then, oh no, that enemy has a massive hitbox. And even though you were literally nowhere near the sword, 
it still counts as doing damage for some reason because the hitboxes are so massive. On top of this, we have rolling being tied to the iframes with the adaptability statistics. So that means that sometimes if you haven't leveled up adaptability as much, you have less iframes. Sometimes you can have more iframes, but sometimes you have less. And this is a whole lot of just changes everything. And having adaptability be tied to how quickly you use items also means everything feels slower because when your adaptability isn't faster, you use items slow, which also slows the whole game down. Also, something else, when you roll and then commit to an attack, your character doesn't automatically change the direction of their attack to face the enemy that you're locked onto. In Dark Souls 1, if you're locked onto an enemy and then roll, your character after the roll will automatically face the enemy that you are locked onto, which means if you attack, you will, your attack will actually hit the enemy. But in Dark Souls 2, you roll, your character can be facing the other way. And you, you press an attack and, oh no, your character attacks some invisible enemy behind them because the, for some reason they're facing the wrong way. Again, this slows the gameplay down. It means that after you roll, you have to wait and then turn your character around and then attack. You have to wait all this time just to do something. Now, sometimes as well, smaller enemies will sometimes deal damage to you in Dark Souls 2 the split second the animation started, not when the weapon hits you, which means that sometimes you can kill an enemy, but because their animation of their weapon coming to hit you and deal damage started, even though the weapon didn't hit you, just because their animation started, it means that you take damage, which can sometimes mean you die. On top of all of this, Dark Souls 2 changed the joystick dead zones, which means that the movement of your character feels different and you have less control, less fine control over the movement of your character in Dark Souls 2 compared to every other game in the series. So Dark Souls 2 uses something called square joystick dead zones, whereas every other game in the series uses circular joystick dead zones, which means that square dead zones just means that the shape of the pattern um, to control uh, the different fine movements your character makes when you are trying to move your character diagonally or turn them around to the left or turn them around diagonally again. Square dead zones means that you have less control over the diagonal movement of your character. Whereas circular dead zones means that you have more control over the diagonal movement of the character. This also translates to the camera movement as well. Which means that uh, when you're moving the camera, you might move it really quick in certain places, but then slower in other places. This is because of the what's called joystick dead zones. And Dark Souls 2, as I said, uses square joystick dead zones, whereas other games in the series use circular joystick dead zones. It's a small thing, but it means that when you are trying to move your character diagonally, it means that you have less control over your character's movement diagonally. And this could be when you're sprinting, this could be in combat when you're trying to run away from an enemy or run around an enemy or dodge to diagonally, all this kind of stuff. It means that sometimes you'll try and roll diagonally, but your character will just roll to the left or forward or backwards when you're trying to roll diagonally. So, what I've tried to say here is the combination of all of these different factors means that Dark Souls 2 has a very different feel to every other game in the series. And in my opinion, it's considerably worse than every other game in the series. A few things here are down to personal preference, but some of them I think are just objectively worse. Luckily, there are now mods which fix a lot of these problems. There's a mod, for example, to change the joystick dead zones. A mod which changes the stamina system to be in line with Dark Souls 1. A mod which fixes some of the enemy hitboxes. And a mod which changes the direction of you at your attack after you roll. But I think, unfortunately, no amount of mods can completely fix the fundamental problems with Dark Souls 2's movement and combat systems. And I think, unfortunately, for me... This whole list of all these different things I've said here is what combines together to make Dark Souls 2 just fundamentally an inferior game to me than every other game in the series. It took a while for me to fully understand because I had to try and look into all the different things that just don't quite work. Because Demon's Souls and Dark Souls 1, they have a distinct feel. 
and Bloodborne and Dark Souls 3 have a distinct feel as well, which is more in line with Dark Souls 1. Dark Souls 2 just feels like such an outlier. I could tell the second I started moving the character and, and just moving them around and feeling the way the game played, I could tell straight away something was off. And I think because of this, this is the reason why, unless Dark Souls 2 was literally your first game in the series, if Dark Souls 2 was your first game, then you were used to all this. This is this is what you knew. This is how the game played for you when you first played Dark Souls. But for me, because I played all the other games first and because I love all the other games, and the other games have sort of set that standard, Dark Souls 2 and the clunky feeling of it just doesn't work for me. And I think it's the reason why it will never be one of my favourite games. But anyway now, let's go back to talking about the areas. So now we're going to move on to No Man's Wharf. No Man's Wharf is an area I've never particularly liked. I didn't really like it the first time I played it through. I don't really like it now. It just, it's a good concept. When you first go into there, there's these wooden planks. It's like wooden pathways. It feels like docks by the sea. And that's sort of what it was. It's, if you remember rightly, it was a shipment where they were shipping, taking prisoners from No Man's Wharf to Last Bastille, where they were keeping them imprisoned. And No Man's Wharf is not a very good area, really. There's loads of enemies which are deliberately covering each other. So if you go to attack one, there'll probably be an archer which is there, which could then shoot you. And then while you're attacking the archer, there'll be some other enemy which will come and ambush you. And then whilst you go and attack him, there's three other people which come and ambush you from behind. Move forward, two other people come up from behind. Move forward, more six people come up from the left, hanging... Um, on these wooden planks, then you move forward and 2,500,332 2, million enemies ambush you from behind. Um, and that's not really very fun. But no, really, No Man's Wharf, it's a good concept. It's a good idea. And I like the fact that there's a really cool shortcut you can do with a bow where you can shoot the bell. Because this whole concept of No Man's Wharf is you have to battle your way through these enemies up to a bell, ring the bell, which brings a ship over, a boat, and you get on the boat, which takes you to the next area. And there's a boss fight on the boat. It's a cool idea, and it's a great visual when you're on that boat, and it's an awesome gimmick of battling a boss on the boat while it's moving. It's really cool, and it's something you don't really see in Dark Souls very often. Even in Elden Ring, there isn't really anything like that, a set piece like that. And But the problem is Nomad's Wharf itself. Battling up to the bell and then going down to the boat is the problem. Because of how many enemies there are, how many are constantly covering each other, so when you attack the one, another one comes to attack you. And it's just not very fun. And you have to do the entire area again every single time to get back up to that bell. Because you only unlock a shortcut by kicking this plank which comes down and gives you a good shortcut to the boss. After you've got through the entire area. And it's a massive battle and it's loads to have to redo. If you die just before you get to the bell or even after the bell on your way back down. Before you kick the shortcut. There's absolutely loads of enemies. And it's very frustrating. The good part about this area, the bit I do like, is the creatures which you um, battle when you're going up close to the bell. It's by some rocks. These dark, really cool looking creatures which are scared of light. So if you bring out a torch, they literally run away, basically. They, they, they become timid and they're scared. So, But they inflict bleed damage, which is very strange and... Another issue with Dark Souls 2 is the sound design. The sound design is not very good because when these enemies hit you, there is literally no sound that plays when they hit you. There's no sound when they hit you. There's no sound when they deal damage, which is very strange. Um, and it seems to be an oversight for some reason. But then they look really cool visually. And the gimmick of them being afraid of the light is very cool. And I don't think these enemies are used enough, really. I would have much preferred this whole area to be really dark, I know Dark Souls 2 was supposed to be dark, but then they had to change the engine and the lighting engine and all this kind of stuff. But I'd have much preferred it, if, even if it was dark just by Dark Souls 2 standards. It doesn't need to be that dark. But you got more of these enemies. Play into these enemies more and how they're scared of the light. And then have it so it's a really difficult area to get through, to battle through, to get your way up to the bell. Maybe the bell can be lit really brightly so you can see the bell really bright. And you just got to try and get up this path. 
And on this path, there's the sconces, and you light the sconces, which sort of means that then, if you push through the area again, these enemies are not going to attack you in those places. And they're like safe havens, almost like Alan Wake. In Alan Wake, I don't know why I'm thinking of Alan Wake there, but like the sconce could be like a safe haven, and then you've got to try and run to each sconce while these creatures are attacking you, and then they run away when you get to the light. Um, I think playing into that more would be better because these hollows, these simple generic hollow enemies are used a lot in Dark Souls 2 and I think using a different enemy here would be better probably especially coming after Forest of Fallen Giants which was not directly before this but not too long before this and this area sort of uses very similar enemies and then Lost Bastille after this uses very similar enemies as well. It would be better to have a bit of the different push the different enemies more then you ring the bell you go back down to where the boat is called and then on the boat you have the flexile sentry which is a really cool boss the absolute highlight of this area is the flexile sentry it's a shame they reuse this enemy twice later because the flexile sentry is a really cool boss he's an awesome design and he has this great arena on the boat and then reusing him as a mini boss later just feels cheap to me like even when they do it with the covetous demon in the dlc which we'll talk about later but i don't like the idea of reusing bosses except for if it's a really early game boss which is then reused as a mini boss right at the end because dark souls 1 does that with the asylum demons the taurus demons and the capra demons when it has you fighting sorry not the asylum demon the taurus demon the capra demon when it has you fighting them again in lost isolith later that is done very well there because it's giving you that sense of power and how you progressed from where you started in the game to when you are later. The difference is here, the flexile sentry you have here is a, is not that hard, but he's pretty difficult. You know, it can be difficult, especially with the water when it starts slowing you down. It reuses the flexile sentry pretty much straight after, like not that long at all after. And he's just a regular enemy. And you got to fight him every single time you try and get to the boss. Ah, oh, oh, sorry, we'll get more to that later. But it's just, it frustrates me because it's a really awesome design. And this boss is a great scene. It just visually looks really cool on the boat with the flexile sentry. He's got two faces and he changes moves it depending on which one's facing you. It's really cool. It's an awesome visual. And it's a shame to see it reused so, in such a, a stupid way just right after this anyway the boat from the no man's wharf it leaves no man's wharf and then the boat arrives at the lost bastille which is the next area we are going to talk about the lost bastille is one of the best areas in the game it has some of the best level design it's a great it's great visually it's got some cool gimmicks and concepts when you arrive in the Lost Bastille from No Man's Wharf, you arrive at sort of like a another little docking area. There's some sand there, and then there's a lift. You take the lift up, and it takes you to one of the ramparts of this Lost Bastille, which is a prison. From there, you go down to a little grassy courtyard area, and you get ambushed by the Pursuer. The Pursuer shows himself again here, which is very cool. It's becoming like Nemesis from Resident Evil 3. Or Mr. X from Resident Evil 2, which is really cool. I like that gimmick. It's cool seeing Dark Souls 2 do this, but it's a shame he doesn't commit to it. Because after Lost Bastille, you never see the Pursuer again. This is the last time you see him, and this is only, what, the third encounter with him? You see him one more time after this, and then he's gone, and you just never see him again, which is a real shame. Um, now you see him two times after this, but it's all in the Lost Bastille. It's all confined to the Lost Bastille area, which is a shame. Um, you go down and then the, the pursuer, and there's a few dogs there, some archers, clear them out or, you know, you can run away from the pursuer if you want to and then he goes. And, but then if you open a gate, there's a little bonfire to your left if you open a shortcut by dropping a barrel down which smashes a wall and reveals this bonfire here. And there's also a blacksmith here. This is a blacksmith who can infuse your weapons with different upgrades. We'll talk more about the weapon upgrade system later. But this is the second blacksmith of the game. It's pretty cool seeing two blacksmiths here again. I'm glad that they have two blacksmiths. It's good. It gives a bit of variety to the game. Different NPCs in different locations. It's pretty cool. As far as I'm aware, there isn't much story to this guy. I don't know if um, there is something I don't know about. But this guy doesn't seem to have much lore narrative at all from what I've seen. Um, he seems to be possessed with flame. 
And then if you light uh, a sconce, he moves away and there's a chest which has a few large titanite shards, I think. Anyway, uh, progressing further up the path past the bonfire then, uh, to your right, there's a little area. And this area uh, is blocked by a fragrant, sorry, by a petrified hollow. And you need to use a fragrant branch of yore, which is an item which um, relieves people of petrification. So you use the fragrant branch of yore. This hollow is no longer petrified and it allows you to access a door which was behind him. But if you don't go this way and instead carry on forward and don't take that path to the right to the petrified person, you encounter Lucasil, who is one of the more interesting uh, characters in this game. You can also encounter her in No Man's Wharf, which I forgot to mention. Uh, she has a really cool story. We'll talk more about her again later because she's probably the best NPC character in Dark Souls 2. She has some interesting story and a pretty cool narrative. And she's one of the better parts in terms of the characters in this game. So we'll continue then past where we opened the door, uh, blocked by the petrified statue. Uh, you take a left and we encounter the boss called the Ruin Sentinels. The Ruin Sentinels are a very cool fight, one of the best bosses in Dark Souls 2. Um, first of all, there's just one Ruin Sentinel on our ledge. And if you manage to defeat this one Ruin Sentinel on the ledge, then suddenly two other ones come. Or you might fall off of the ledge, fall down below, take a little bit of damage, not too much. And then you have to attack all three of them and fight all three of them. Which is a very difficult fight, but it pushes the concept Dark Souls 2 tries to push. Which is, Dark Souls 2 is more about taking your time and waiting for an opportunity to attack multiple enemies at once. Because Dark Souls 2 does push that multiple enemy encounter as opposed to one-on-one -on -one combat. Which is what Dark Souls 1 mainly was about. Dark Souls 2 is pushing... The group combat having multiple enemies you're fighting at once and ruin sentinels is a perfect example of that where you've got to try and control the three enemies all attacking you at once they're different movesets all happening at once trying to judge and find a good window to attack but the problem is that you have loads of healing items and therefore even you could sometimes you can be reckless try and take load try and do loads of hits in one go and just tank it with life gems but we'll talk more about the healing mechanics again a bit later once you've beaten the ruined sentinels that you find this room has absolutely loads of illusory walls there's four illusory walls in this one room illusory walls in this game you open them by pressing the a button or the x button depending on your chosen platform uh, instead of hitting them in dark souls 1 you had to hit a wall to open it if it was an illusory wall but in dark souls 2 you press the a or x button for some reason which is a bit strange. Don't know why they changed it. Probably just to confuse people and make people not realise that there was illusory walls there. Because otherwise people would be going around hitting every wall like they did in Dark Souls 1. But they have some interesting items. I think one of them has the target shield, which is really cool. Uh, which is good because it's harder to parry in Dark Souls 2. They nerfed parrying as well as backstabbing. Um, so having the target shield makes it a bit easier, which is pretty good. But parrying is not as viable in this game anyway. Pushing forward, we have a bit of a stupid moment where you're walking through a hallway after defeating the Ruined Sentinels with all your souls. And then suddenly an enemy in one of the prison cells explodes. It makes a noise going, ah, and then it explodes. And then it deals absolutely loads of damage. Now the thing is, once you know it's there, on future playthroughs, you can just run straight past him and he doesn't do any damage. But if you're just being cautious, slowly walking down that corridor like you would do if you hear a strange noise, it will explode and deal absolutely loads of damage. And if you're probably at 50% or lower health, it will kill you. And it's a shame because there's a bonfire right there, right in front of you there. But anyway... Uh, then the rest of the area is sort of playing into enemies like that. Those kind of enemies which explode, they make a noise and then explode. You have to try and uh, deal with lots of them in these future areas, these areas of above. Um, these areas in front of you where you have to deal with loads of those enemies while sort of trying to find a way through this prison because it's quite confusing. Um, from this bonfire you also can access the Belfry Luna which is another area we'll talk about in a second if you go down. Um, but then if you don't go that way and instead carry on forward, there's quite a few areas. This is a very well designed area because there's a shortcut which goes down, can take you to a different area, a different path, which can then connect to another area from before. There's very good level design here in the last Bastille. 
The Lost Bastille is by far one of the best and strongest areas of this game. It feels the most like Dark Souls because some of the later areas don't really feel like this. And it's a shame that all the best areas are put at the front of the game and then the back half of the game is just so weak because Dark Souls 2 had some great ideas and some great areas like this. This area, this prison area is fantastic. It's Dark Souls at the top of its game. The boss fight is good as well. And the next boss fight, the one we're going to fight in a second, is really good as well. It's just a shame, really, that the rest of the game isn't this good. Because Lost Bastille is fantastic. Let's talk about the Belfry of Luna, then. If you go down from the bonfire, you go to this very small area called the Belfry of Luna. Um, you see a small little dwarf guy. Uh, who you talk to he literally is like a dwarf he reminds me of a dwarf or a gnome and i think he's a gnome actually and these are the protectors of this bell uh the, the belfry luna it's one bell and there's these two different factions the belfry luna and belfry Sol. there's two bell keepers who are at war with each other one um like the the people the gnomes from belfry luna will go and try and ring the bell at belfry soul and the gnomes from belfry soul will try and go and ring the bell at belfry luna apparently it was like a king and a queen that both lived in these towers um i don't know the lore of this it's a it just sounds a bit stupid to me but anyway you go up, you go up the, the bell tower and you go to the top and you fight these gnomes on the way up. Even if you join their covenant, for some reason they still attack you. I don't quite understand that. Um, it feels like they shouldn't attack you if you join their covenant. But anyway. Um, you go to the top of the tower. Pull a lever which opens a portcullis. Which is down lower. Which allows you access to a boss. And the boss is the Belfry Gargoyles. Which is literally the Bell Gargoyles from Dark Souls 1. Except on steroids. And the Belfry Luna is not designed as well as the Lost Bastille. Because I don't like this boss at all. I understand that this boss is trying to say, Okay, Dark Souls 1, you had to fight two gargoyles. Now we're going to go all out and give you six. And it's supposed to be trying to also push that same concept as the Four Kings. Where the longer you're in the boss for, the more gargoyles will spawn. And if you can kill them quickly... You don't have to deal with as many at once. Okay. I understand that. But the problem with the Four Kings was the Four Kings was like a test of your damage per second output. And if you dealt loads of damage to the first Four King, then the, then you can you could kill it quickly. And then the second would come out and you can deal with it comfortably. The Belfry Gargoyles you'd never feel comfortable with. Because if you're trying to attack one Gargoyle, you still have a second one to deal with and a third one to deal with all at the same time. And the gargoyles' attacks are not designed in such a way, and you don't have enough room to properly balance all three gargoyles coming to attack you at once, trying to watch what attacks they're doing, also while trying to get in attacks on your own. I do not enjoy this boss fight very much. It feels like they missed the point of the bell gargoyles, which, as I said, was like a damage per second output check. The thing with the bell for gargoyles here is it's even placed at a similar part of the game. In Dark Souls 1, you just encounter your blacksmith, and then you have the Bell Gargoyles. So it's about, okay, you have you upgraded your weapon? Yeah, then you can carry on forward. But the Bell for Gargoyles are not like that. It's like, how have you upgraded the, your weapon? Yeah, you upgraded it? Well, you need to upgrade it more, because there's six Bell for Gargoyles here. And I just find it frustrating, because it's like it takes such a great gimmick and a great boss, and then just guts it. I don't enjoy this boss at all, and I do feel like it misses the point of the original Bell Gargoyles from Dark Souls 1. And I find it frustrating, and this is something that I would personally skip. Anyway, you push past the Belfry Gargoyles once you defeat them, and you get a bonfire. And you can have a small optional encounter where you can drop down a ladder uh, to an area which looks like the Capra Demons Arena from Dark Souls 1, which is a small little Easter egg. I like this. You have about six dogs down there and one NPC invader. Uh, I like it's just a small Easter egg. That's all this is. So I like this. It's, again, it's not like Dark Souls 3 where it's really shoving this nostalgia in your face. Here it's like there's a ladder. It takes you down and there's just a room. And that room just happens to look like the Capra Demons boss arena from Dark Souls 1. It's just an Easter egg. 
And if you didn't know about it, you wouldn't pick up on it. And you, you just think it's a room. So I like it. It's just a small little nod to the to Dark Souls 1, which I appreciate. So then if instead of going to the Belfry Luna, you instead progress further through the Lost Bastille, you then reach Sinner's Rise. Sinner's Rise is just the Lost Bastille Part 2. They just decided to give it another title card for some reason. It's something Dark Souls 2 does a lot. It just like separates one area into two areas for some reason. Or it will give a small area a title card for no particular reason just because it like wants to for some reason give an area a title card. I don't know why there's a really bad example of it in Brightstone Curve Seldora. Um, but we'll talk about that when we get to it. So Sinner's Rise is literally a building and you go there. You cross this bridge where there's an archer shooting at you. Go up and there's a bonfire. Take out the archer. And then there's a lift which goes down. You go down the lift. And then you reach a long path filled with water. Here is where they reuse the flex cell sentry. Which is what I hate. The flex... Like, I understand from a law perspective... That it makes sense. The flex cell sentry was guarding the prisoners that were being escorted from No Man's Wharf to the Lost Bastille. Okay, so it makes sense that there would be another flex cell sentry in Sinner's Rise guarding the prisoners that are down here. Okay, it does make sense from a law perspective, but I still don't like it because, again, the set piece of the flex cell sentry on the boat taking you from No Man's Wharf to the Lost Bastille was really awesome and it was a good boss fight. It was designed well, had a cool visual gimmick, the two sides of the flexile sentry, then they just reuse it. And I, I think, like, to me, it's like about sort of like, you should sort of be proud of what you made. Like, flexile sentry is a good fight. And I think there's something to be said about, like, keeping that boss fight, like, keeping its integrity. Just have that boss fight be awesome on No Man's Wharf. In Sinner's Rise, it still has the same health and everything, but it's just being used as a random enemy placed in Sinner's Rise just to block your path to a different boss fight. It's just, it it makes the boss lose some of its integrity to me. But anyway, um, the Sinner's, Sinner's Rise is home to the boss of the area called the Lost Sinner, which is the first of the four great souls, which you get as part of your main objective and mission in Dark Souls 2. Um, there's a few prisoners on your way to the boss, but then when you get to the boss arena, it looks really awesome. Uh, but there's a path to your left and a path to your right with some oil trails on them. Uh, Sinner's Rise is a boss fight you have to do completely in the dark unless you use a torch and light these the, the oil on the left and the oil on the right, which then lights up the boss arena for you. Because the Lost Sinner is blind. The boss is completely blind, and it's been corrupted and taken over by one of the Chaos, by some of the Chaos um, bugs or... I don't know what they're called, some chaos bugs from Dark Souls 1. And the boss is blind, so therefore the arena is completely dark, but that boss can see and sort of still knows you're there, even though it's dark. So you need to light it for yourself. You light it, and this is a really good boss. I really like the Lost Sinner. It's got some great moves. The moves are well telegraphed, but fair. It's a difficult boss, again, but fair. I really do like and appreciate this boss fight, and I think it's really good. And it's one of the best fights in the game. Um, I beat it in my recent playthrough with Lucatil because I was trying to do Lucatil's story. Uh, but I almost feel bad for doing that because I I think it'd be a great boss to encounter one-on-one. -on -one. And I beat Fumonite one-on-one, -on -one, so I really would like to go back and beat Lost in a soul level one, probably. One-on-one. Um, -on -one. I can tell this is a really good fight. It'll be really fun to do that way. Now I'm going to talk uh, about the difficulty of Dark Souls 2 because it's a topic that gets brought up quite a bit. The Dark Souls 2 sort of approaches difficulty in a different way to previous games. And Dark Souls 2 tries to make the levels that you progress through noticeably harder. This started a trend that the series would sort of continue of making each game subsequently more challenging than the last. But Dark Souls 2 succeeds and fails at this in many ways. Dark Souls 2, you see, it tries to increase difficulty by having the player get ambushed in many places, with enemies coming up behind you much more often than in previous games. Enemies 
while pretending to be dead and then they get up. Enemies jump down from high locations where you can't see them. And there's many things like this in Dark Souls 2. Enemies, they now also stay aggressive for much longer even if you try and run past them. Runs to bosses are now really difficult with enemies that don't stop attacking you even if you run past them. And now you can even get hit whilst you try to go through a fog game. Something that they didn't do in Dark Souls 1. Many enemies are deliberately placed in spots where you can't see them or even get to them for a while. But they keep shooting arrows or magic at you. In one of the DLCs in Dark Souls 2 there are horses that appear out of basically nowhere and then charge at you and knock you down instantly. You have to spend 5 minutes running through a misty ice tundra filled with these enemies every time you want to try the boss of that area again. There's also an area where if you try and run through it to get to the boss, over 20 insanely powerful dragon knights will murder you in seconds. In Dark Souls 2, there are loads of things that just feel completely unfair. And that's in massive contrast to every other game in the series. In Demon's Souls and Dark Souls 1, the game was a challenge. But if you were observant and paid attention to your surroundings, you could always get through it. And the game was built in a way where it was hard but fair. And that's something the Souls series ended up becoming known for. But Dark Souls 2... Is not hard but fair. It's hard for the sake of hard and bullshit for the sake of bullshit. And that's a massive point against this game. And it's why many people feel like the designers of Dark Souls 2 didn't quite understand what makes the series so special. In contrast to this hard, oppressive difficulty though, the bosses in Dark Souls 2 are actually quite easy and all generally can be killed in a couple of attempts with a few notable exceptions which are mainly in the DLC. The bosses almost feel too easy for someone who may have beaten Dark Souls 1 a few times previously and this is such a stark contrast. In the DLC for this game you see Dark Souls 2 returns to the hard but fair design philosophy of Dark Souls 1 probably due to these areas being created under the direction of Yui Tenamura. The bosses here as well are very difficult but fair, with again a couple of exceptions, but for the most part, bosses are hard, but don't have bullshit hitboxes that frustrate you and can be beaten through sheer perseverance. Dark Souls 3 after Dark Souls 2 would then continue this trend of increasing the difficulty, but the difference is, in Dark Souls 3, they approach it in a different way, by keeping the game fair, but making enemies and bosses generally more difficult to compensate for that. Dark Souls 3 approaches it in a different way, where it sort of more understands what made Dark Souls 1 and Demon's Souls so special, instead of going through the more for the more annoying and bullshit tactics that Dark Souls 2 went for to try and make the game more difficult. So then, continuing forward, we're going to talk about the Huntsman's Cops now. So, after speaking to a certain lady that sells you miracles in Hyde's Tower of Flame after defeating the Dragon Rider boss fight, she then goes back to not quite Medulla, but to the path leading to Hyde's Tower of Flame from Medulla. And if you go up to her and then ask her, she reveals a secret to you, which is that the path leading to Hyde's Tower of Flame, you can sort of change that path, the contraption, and it will allow you access to a different area instead. She tells you to look down and pray, and then whilst you're looking down, she just gives it a slap, and then it sort of activates the mechanism, so there's no magic going on there. She's tricking you to try and make it look like she is all that, but she's not really. Progressing through here, then we reach Huntsman's Cops. Huntsman's Cops is an area I really liked, actually, uh, when doing it, for the most part, up until one specific thing. Um, Huntsman's Cops is actually a good area. I think it's designed very well. The enemies here are designed very well. It's got a unique look to it. In concept, it's very similar to the Dark Root Garden and Dark Root Base and all that from Dark Souls 1. But it actually, it's got a different color scheme. It's got different gimmicks going on. And I think it's actually quite a good area. The enemies here as well have a very good design. It reminds me of enemies we'd see later in Dark Souls 3. Um, where they look sort of like executioners and they look quite like they're going to torture you and all this kind of stuff. They look very cool. Their designs are really cool. And we have poison butterflies in the trees, which means you have to look out for them and then try and dodge the poison that they flap from their wings when you go near the areas. And this whole area here is very well designed and is a very good area and plays very well, except for the, the giant 
frog looking creature which scares me because i i have a phobia of frogs but other than that creature this whole area is designed very well and the huntsman's copse um has two paths well actually a few paths it's got quite a few secrets in it as well quite a lot of secrets and and small little ways that can give you access to hidden items and things um one of the paths leads to the skeleton lord there's another path which leads sort of to a bonfire and then connects back to the skeleton lord's boss and uh, you encounter an NPC here who we'll talk about later who is the guy that's looking for Pate who really doesn't like him but he's also not very nice either and he is sitting by a bonfire and then you have a path which leads to the undead purgatory but before we talk about the undead purgatory we need to finish off Huntsman's Cops because there's a path which leads to undead purgatory which is actually before the end of Huntsman's Cops but so we still actually we need to go forward and then back so let's keep going through Huntsman's Cops you go past the bonfire where the guy is sitting at who's looking for Pate there's a few skeletons and you're introduced to the new necromancer here which is visually looks very different to the necromancer from Dark Souls 1 but it functions the same purpose they keep reviving the skeletons over and over again and you need to take out the necromancers and then the skeletons can die permanently this is shocked me the first time because they don't look that much at all like the necromancers from dark souls one and it actually it took me a while to realize that they were the necromancers that that was actually their purpose and sadly i did this after the undead purgatory so i beat the executioner's chariot before this before i even encountered the necromancers here so i didn't know what the necromancers were doing when i was trying to take on the executioner's chariot i didn't know that they were reviving the skeletons in that boss fight but anyway, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, we encounter the Skeleton Lords boss fight then here. The Skeleton Lords is Dark Souls... It's the first time we're seeing Dark Souls 2 um, doing a boss for the sake of a boss. Here, this boss is literally loads of skeletons and then three big major skeletons which are sort of summoning the skeletons. And that is the boss. It's not really a boss. It's just a collection of enemies. But they're giving them... A boss boss music and a boss name so they're bosses um so you have to defeat the skeleton lords it's a very easy boss you can usually kill them your first or second try it should be your first try but sometimes you might make a stupid mistake or whatever we all know this uh, they bring back the wheel skeletons from dark souls 1 which is nice to see them back you know they're annoying but it's nice to see them come back because they are now a recurring villain in the dark souls franchise they were in demon souls in one form dark souls 1 and now dark souls 2 so they are reoccurring villains the wheel of skeletons uh the skeleton lords is a bit of a disappointing boss really um but they're not too hard you just get them out of the way and then move forward f to the harvest valley from here but we're not going to do the harvest valley we're going to go back and take the other path that we could take through huntsman's cops which instead takes us to undead purgatory I thought this was the right way to progress forward because it's a massive bridge and a huge building that just looks like that's where you're supposed to go but it's an optional building and this is literally what it says the undead purgatory it is what it literally is supposed to be is that skeletons are put into this place to constantly be killed over and over again by the executioner's chariot for all of eternity which is a very it's very dark when you think about it they just put these people in here to die again and again and again in a never-ending cycle of death and pain it's it's very metal isn't it and the executioner's chariot also looks like it, it's really cool it looks like something that should be on a metal album cover it it looks fantastic but the problem with the executioner's chariot is not the executioner's chariot it is the run up to the executioner's chariot the run to this boss is one of the worst in all of souls history i think this could be worse than one we'll talk about later in the frigid outskirts because at least that one you can just run for most of it and not have to worry about dealing with enemies here to get to the executioner's chariot you have to deal with one of the massive biggest difficulty spikes in dark souls you have to go through this forest, which is fine, run up a path to the right, up alongside this sort of cliff, and then you you deal with these four. They look like torturers, and they are very strong enemies. They deal loads of damage, and, you, and all four of them come and attack you at the same time. And you have to deal with all four of them at once. It is very difficult. It is 
painful. And the problem here is, this is what frustrates me, and this is Dark Souls 2 doing hard for the sake of hard. Because after you've beaten these four guys, you could see that they very easily could have added a ladder down to the bonfire. Because literally, after you defeated these four torturers, you are above the bonfire. You are right above where the bonfire is. And they could have put a ladder for you to kick there as a nice shortcut to the boss which would have made the run to the bus easy and really convenient. But they didn't do it. They didn't add that ladder there for you to kick. They deliberately didn't put a shortcut, which is something that frustrates me more than, than anything, because it would have been a good shortcut. It would have actually been good level design, and me thinking, oh, Dark, that's a good point for Dark Souls 2, putting some good level design in the game. Instead... They choose not to do that and make the run to the boss more frustrating than it needs to be. And that frustrates me more than anything. It, it frustrates me a lot because they deliberately didn't do it. Which is what causes the problem for me. Because the run to this boss, the boss is not hard. But because I didn't know about the gimmick with the necromancers here. Because I didn't realise those creatures were necromancers when I first did this execution as chariot boss fight recently. The skeletons were constantly respawning and making it really difficult for me because I didn't realize that they were, you know, I was thinking, oh, they're just constantly going to respawn forever then. I didn't realize that those one creatures were necromancers, but they were, so they were constantly reviving them. And that meant that it took me a few more tries to do the Executioner's Chariot than it probably should have. But anyway, the boss looks really cool. It's a cool gimmick. It's more a gimmick boss. It's more a puzzle boss than anything. Fighting the horse is actually relatively easy once you close the... Because the gimmick is you have to defeat two necromancers, then pull a lever. And this horse is constantly running in circles around this building. So when you pull this lever, it brings down a portcullis. And then the horse runs into the portcullis. And that means that you just have to fight the horse then. Um, because then it, you're sort of fighting it and you've stopped it from running around in circles so you can actually fight it properly. The boss is cool. I like the boss. The run up to the boss is unbelievably frustrating and not... it's it's annoying. Anyway, after you've beaten this you get access to one of the covenants in the game. We'll talk more about covenants later but there's also a bonfire here which you can warp to and from which can help you get back from here. And now we're going to push through to Harvest Valley. Harvest Valley is the first area, I would say, out of all of these, which is not enjoyable. Harvest Valley is basically a collection of poison pits, um, desert sorceresses, which shoot very strong pyromancers at you, which deal a lot of damage. Massive giants with small enemies riding them, which deal a lot of damage. And this whole area is just not really very fun. It's very linear. Uh, there's no sort of level design or anything to this. No, you just go from one bonfire to another bonfire to another bonfire to the next area. And this is sort of... This reminds me more of Dark Souls 3 in a way when it's very, very linear. And there's straight paths between areas. Then in Dark Souls 3 you do have some much better designed areas. But there are a few linear ones which are not as good. This area is not enjoyable. And... It's the first area that I think is definitely not. And luckily you have the desert sorceresses, which are a good treat for the eyes. But other than that, there's nothing here. There's no redeeming qualities here. The poison pits are frustrating and you just run through loads of poison pits, having to deal with the poison damage just to get a few items. They deliberately put there and then you get to Earth and Peak, the next area. This Harvest Valley is not much here. You have the Heirs of the Sun Covenant, which is like bringing back Praise the Sun and a reference to Solaire from Dark Souls 1. But other than that, Harvest Valley is very annoying. You also meet Cloan here, who is another nice treat for the eyes. And then she goes back to Majula. But we'll talk more about characters later again. Earth and Peak is a bit more of a better designed area, but it's still not great, really. It is a tower. You have to go from one bonfire to the next again. No good shortcuts or anything here. You go from one bonfire, climbing up this tower with more desert sorceresses. You have these big enemies, lots of poison pots, because this is dealing with poison again. So you accidentally go through these pots. It deals poison damage to you. 
And there are some decent, there's a couple of cool enemies here. There's this one enemy which sort of jumps down from on top of the roof. It'll be on, on the ceiling or on a ledge and it will jump down. He's got these claws. He deals bleed damage. It's a pretty cool design. It looks very cool visually. And, but this area, again, it's, it's not very good. And I think, unfortunately, it's, it's just sort of, we're reaching the point now where Dark Souls 2 sort of starts to fall off a bit. We've, We've gone past the good areas. I think Huntsman's Copse is the last well-designed area. Even though it did miss out a good opportunity to, for, a, for a shortcut. But we've reached the, the, the poorer area now. There's two bosses in Earth and Peak. Uh, the first one is the Covetous Demon. Which gets a lot of stick. Because it's literally just a big blob. And he just rolls over. And, and he's just... Uh, he's not visually appealing at all. He looks stupid. He rolls onto you as an attack and flings his body at you. He's supposed to be this Eden too much, and now he's just turned into this big monster. It, the story and concept is just stupid. If he was a mini boss, we could potentially get away with it. But again, they're giving him the boss music. They're giving him the boss bar on the screen. You've got to treat him like a boss. This is a boss in the same way that, you know, like Manus was or Artorius was. This is a boss. Bosses in Dark Souls are supposed to mean something. They come with an expectation. And this guy, I mean, come on. Yeah, it's okay to have an easy boss every now and again, but he looks stupid. The story is stupid, and he's guarding the Earth and Peak for God's sake. He's, he's guarding this whole area. <sighs> it's frustrating. Anyway, one of the gimmicks of Earth and Peak is that uh, Mitha, the next boss, the main boss of Earth and Peak, the, the boss at the end of Earth and Peak, when you reach the end of the level is Mitha the Baneful Queen, and she can regenerate her health by standing in a poison pit. And the whole boss arena is a poison pit, unless you get a torch and burn a flag or a, a material wrapped around a windmill. Okay, I don't get what that has to do with the poison in her pit. I mean, maybe it's that that activates the windmill, which then... I don't know. I can't think of a way in which burning some fabric on a windmill stops a poison, like a pit of poison. I don't understand. But anyway, Mitha is a good visual. Again, this is a good visual fight. Like, visually, she looks cool. She, you know, she's carrying her head. And she's like some... like a, She looks like a mermaid serpent creature carrying her head and then she uses her head and flings it at you for attacks it's cool it looks cool visually again it looks very cool it's a shame that the boss is very easy to put it into perspective after i beat mitha the first time when i was playing uh, for my recent playthrough the footage corrupted and i didn't have the footage for some reason so i used a bonfire aesthetic to bring her back in New Game Plus, which means that she was a New Game Plus level difficulty. I still beat her first go. So that says it all about this boss, that it's just too easy. And that's a, that's a problem with a lot of Dark Souls 2 bosses. They're just too easy. They just, I don't quite understand what it is. They're just, the bosses don't have enough health. Their attacks are not quick enough. You can dodge them very easily. They're very, 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 predictable attacks are very well telegraphed and that's why they try to bump up the difficulty in the levels but in the levels it's just frustrating so earth and peak is a weak area and then after that we progress through to iron keep but before we talk about iron keep we need to talk about the level and world design of dark souls 2 because this is where we get the first it's it's what's it's notorious this here here we've reached the top of earth and peak okay and we've beaten mitha the baneful queen we get into a lift at the top of earth and peak we're at the top of this big tower okay you get in a lift and in the lift it takes you up through the sky and then you come up from that lift and then suddenly you walk out and you're in Iron Keep and the floor there is lava. So we've literally gone through the sky and come up through the floor into Iron Keep. It makes absolutely no logical sense at all. It's now 
since the release of Dark Souls 2, the developers come out and said that there was a miscommunication during the development and it was a mistake. And they did not mean to do it in that way. But unfortunately, it still says a lot about Dark Souls 2. In that, like, what Dark Souls, one of the main things Dark Souls 1 was known for was having fantastic world and level design. Where the world connected and each different area connected to a different area in some awesome way that felt like it felt natural and like a real world, real places in the real world where you could see one area from another area. And if you traveled there on foot, you could get there. You could walk from one area to another. You could walk from the you could literally walk from the end of Dark Souls 1 to the start of Dark Souls 1 and never have to go through a loading screen. That's how good the world design was. And it was all connected properly in real ways that felt like a real world would connect to each other. And then you have Dark Souls 2 with this. Where you just go through the sky and suddenly you're, in, uh, you're at the Iron Keep where there's lava on the floor. You go from a sky to a floor of lava. It doesn't make any sense at all. And in Dark Souls 2, another thing that Dark Souls 2 does a lot, which is something that isn't noticed as much, but I notice it, is that when you walk from one area to another, suddenly the world seems to change massively. When you walk from the Shaded Woods to Drangolate Castle, you go through a tunnel. And when you come from one side of the tunnel to the other, the world changes completely. On one end of it, there's a clear sky and uh, brown and grey ground beneath you and green trees. You come out the other end, it's a massive thunderstorm. It's night time and the, the whole area is dark and there's just water everywhere. and It just looks completely different. And yet all you've done is go through a tunnel and walk through it for about 10 seconds. And suddenly the whole area and world looks completely different. It doesn't make any logical sense. Whereas in Dark Souls 1, it's believable that Sen's Fortress was above Dark Root Garden. Because when you walk there, you can see the area transition. And it still makes geographical sense. And the, the architecture still looks like it would exist in that same world. The architecture of Undead Parish. It's not really that far from like the catacombs. And yet still, you can still sort of say, okay, you can understand that they exist very close together and it still looks similar enough. The color palette and the grading still look similar for it to be realistic. Whereas in Dark Souls 2, you walk five minutes and the whole world has completely changed around you. And I was just talking about the world design there, but this is the same for level design as well. In Dark Souls 1, Dark Souls 1 was known for having fantastic level design, where you would go through a level and suddenly the level would connect back to itself in a natural way, and you would suddenly think, oh, that's where this door leads to, or oh, now I'm back here. Those fantastic moments where you realize that actually you're not that far from the bonfire you started at. Those fantastic moments. Dark Souls 2 has a couple of them. An example being Forest of Fallen Giants, the first area of the game, has one. And then I don't think you see a great shortcut like that again. I think there's one in Lost Bastille. I'll give Lost Bastille a credit there. There's a couple of shortcuts there. But then after Lost Bastille, you don't see another shortcut until I think Undead Crypt, where you lower a bridge which connects back to an early part of the level. No Man's Wolf, no, that's a lie. No Man's Wolf does have one as well, but that's before Last Bastille anyway. So there's a couple, like I said, in the earlier section of the game, you have a few of them. And then you ha you go from Lost Bastille all the way to the Undead Crypt, which is about 10 areas, maybe 12 areas, with no shortcuts whatsoever, just bonfire to bonfire to bonfire. No good level design. It's a massive step down. And it's a shame because those kind of things, that level design and world design is what elevates Dark Souls above being any other random adventure fantasy game that you see out there. That's what elevates Dark Souls and makes it another level. That's what makes it like some of the best games ever created is things like that. When the developers have put the care into the level and the world to make it connect in such a fantastic way because... They're fucking fantastic at making amazing video games. That's why we love From Software is because they're that good at what they do. They create these amazing worlds that feel natural and connect to each other. And Dark Souls 2 
is a sequel to Dark Souls 1, but Dark Souls 1 was the absolute master at doing that, and Dark Souls 2 just has some of the worst examples of world design I think I've seen in gaming. I cannot tell you another game with such a massive blunder as that. When you go up from a tower, you go through the sky, and suddenly you come, you come up, and you, there's a floor of lava. It's just, and it's a shame because Dark Souls 2 is usually better than that and above that kind of stuff. And unfortunately, that's when it breaks immersion and suddenly you remember you're playing a video game and you don't feel immersed in the world because the world is doesn't make any logical sense. And that's a shame. So then afterwards, we have the Iron Keep. The Iron Keep... It's a strange level because I think in many ways it's one of the best areas in the game, but then in many ways it's also not. It's quite strange. Visually, it's very, very appealing. It looks really cool. You've got this awesome castle basically on the lava, which just right there is a cool idea. And then you've got Alumnites, which are... They have the same sound as the Black Knights and the Silver Knights when you kill them, which makes you think, oh, okay, these are the game's equivalent of that. But then I thought the Hyde Knights were supposed to be this game's equivalent of that, so I'm not quite sure. But either way, these are cool enemies. I really do enjoy fighting them, including their bigger and more powerful counterparts as well. You have the larger Alon Knights. They're almost like the Alon Knight Captains or something like that, which have stronger weapons, more health, and deal a lot more damage. Um, these are pretty cool fights as well. I, I think these are almost like a better version of the regular Alon Knights because the regular Alon Knights are just a little bit too weak. They have a little bit too little health to make them really a challenge for me anyway. I don't know how other people feel. Um, all the Alon Knights also have a bow. So if you're sort of far enough away from them, it seems that they can shoot you or at least some can uh, with a bow. And in the Iron Keep, they're deliberately placed in certain places where usually whilst you're trying to take down one with a sword one with a bow will be able to shoot you so you have to sort of like allow the alon knights to come forward a little bit so you can take them out without being shot by arrows which push you back and deal quite a bit of damage um this area the enemies are placed quite well in this area the enemy placement here feels good it feels almost like dark souls one levels where they're placed in a good way and it's a good challenge to get through this area and find the way through um but it's not too challenging so i do enjoy this section of the iron keep this initial section fighting the alon knights i like this section there's also a trader here who reminds me of the ai shimai guy from dark souls one um he sits on the floor he doesn't really have much story but he sells some interesting items and then pushing forward you have the smelter demon who is sort of the boss of that initial section with the alon knights but it's optional you can find a way to go around him this smelter demon i like this smelter demon he doesn't have too much health he doesn't have too much physical resistance and his attacks are pretty well telegraphed and you it's a good fight it's not too hard because, like I said, it, his attacks are well telegraphed. But he has a couple of moves which occasionally catch me off guard, especially because there's also another version of the Smelter Demon, who we'll talk about later, who has different timings to his attacks than this version of the Smelter Demon. This version of the Smelter Demon is generally referred to as the Red Smelter Demon. Um, but I like this fight. It's a good fight. The other one, not so much. But this one, I do like this fight and afterwards you get a bonfire if you manage to beat him so that's sort of like the incentive to beating this smelter demon is you get that extra bonfire but you don't really need it because there's another one not long afterwards anyway um which is placed there probably just in case you missed this one but oh uh, well uh, then we encounter some more of this sort of turtle knight enemies which have the big mace and the shell on their back there's a few more of those coming up and I, I'm a bit divided on these enemies. They're okay in the Forest of Fallen Giants. Here, I just don't think they sort of work here. Like, visually, it just feels in contrast to the other enemies in this area. So it's a bit strange. But um, then we have another bonfire to the left. Now, this bonfire is one of the most frustrating bonfires in the game. Because it's a bonfire. You have to drop down a small little waist-high ledge to get to this bonfire, and you can't get back up without doing an entire other small area. 
like I said, it's a small area. It's the other counterpart to the Belfry Luna from earlier. This one is the Belfry Soul. But I'm going to talk about that in a second. But I just want to say the bonfire, because the bonfire is technically in the Iron Keep, not in the Belfry Soul. The bonfire is really annoying because to get back to the Iron Keep from this waist high ledge, you have to complete the entire Belfry Soul small area to then drop back down to the Iron Keep to carry on with the Iron Keep if you use this bonfire. It's almost like a trick bonfire. If you've used the bonfire for the Smelter Demon and you've got that bonfire, don't even bother resting at this bonfire unless you're going to do the Belfry Soul. Just use the other one because there's no, there's, this is just frustrating. Um, I really like the gimmick of these little pressure pl plates and if you step on these pressure plates it makes big sections of the floor just drop down. You can use it to kill enemies but if you accidentally step on the wrong one you can kill yourself. I like this gimmick, it feels very video gaming. The Iron Keep is sort of like the Sen's Fortress of Dark Souls 2 by having quite a few traps and things for you to dodge. Um, it's a bit more video gamey than Sen's Fortress. And by video gaming, I mean things that just don't feel like they really would exist in real life. And like people in certain places and environments that don't look like they would exist in real life. Dark Souls 1, the only sort of area that felt like that was Sen's Fortress in Dark Souls 1. It was the only environment that didn't feel like it would really be a real place. The other areas, there's, there's I mean, I suppose Lost Isolith and Demon Ruins don't feel like they would be a real location in real life, but... Iron Keep and a lot of Dark Souls 2 areas feel more like that. They feel like they wouldn't really exist in real life. And this section of Iron Keep, like, who would do that? Who would put pressure plates on the floor which could accidentally kill yourself with? Like, it just doesn't make sense. Anyway, so the final boss of the Iron Keep is the Iron King. He is... He's the only boss, right, in probably most Souls games that feels like he could exist in any other video game, the Iron King. Now, visually... He looks really cool, but he has this, the way you defeat him is because he tries to smash you with his hand, like smack, because he's really big and like he's waist high with you, so you come up to like his waist, and well no, you're standing where his waist is and his, like, his feet are in lava, sort of like the, uh, the Cease of Discharge where he's standing in a big pool of lava, and he goes to whack you with his hand, but he keeps his hand down for like five seconds, which just feels really stupid. It feels like something you'd see in a boss fight in, like, Arkham Asylum or something. Like, I love Arkham Asylum, but the bosses in the game are not good. And it feels like something you'd see in that game, where, like, it just goes to, like, smash his hand down and then keeps it there for five seconds. There's no reason why he would leave his hand there on that ledge for five seconds, just to allow you to stab it. But he does. It just doesn't make much sense, but... The boss isn't that great, but it's very easy, luckily. For some reason, when I first played this Dark Souls 2, like, five, six years ago, I struggled with this guy. I don't know why. Um, he's ridiculously easy. I beat him first try on this run for this um, this video. But anyway, uh, and then after this, you've completed this section of the game. So sort of the second great soul. So the first one was the Lost Sinner. The second one is the Iron King. And then... Um, but next, we're going to go back to the Belfry Soul, then. The Belfry Soul is sort of like a subsection of the Iron Keep. It still has similar sort of themes, but it's the other tower with those goblin, gnome, creature, thing people. Uh, so you climb up the ladder from that bonfire, that stupid bonfire, and then you've got loads of gnomes, and you've got people... Shooting you, there's an enemy invasion, you can bring a bell, but I don't think the bell does anything. I may be wrong in saying this, but I don't think that other bell you can ring does anything. Or does it? I, I'm not sure. But anyway, then you go around. I think it might open a door maybe to allow you to progress further through the Belfry Salt. I'm not sure. Um, there's just a lot of gnomes, really. And then a chest at the end, and then you drop back down and carry on with the Iron Keep. These Belfry locations are made for PvP. So there's two covenants. You can join one covenant to fight and defend each bell. Um, I don't think it ever really took off. Because even five or six years ago when I originally played Dark Souls 2, it wasn't something that people were doing then. I know it was still after the game's main life cycle was over, but it, you know, it was more alive then than it is now. And people weren't really taking part in this. So I'm not sure how much this to ever took off. But I don't think it's a, a very good gimmick doesn't really have much incentive you don't really get much for it but anyway so that's the belfry soul the 
next we're moving on to the pit um, which is sort of another small location so we'll cover this very quickly it's just the main pit in Medulla um, you drop down this big pit uh, you can get a ladder uh, from Laddersmith Gilligan who you find in Earth and Keep he can drop down a variety of ladders uh, and if you get different length ladders it means you can skip a different portion of the pit um, because and you have to take less fall damage as a result of that uh, if you get the biggest ladder you can skip one of the areas the optional areas and get straight down to a later area which is quite helpful uh, but if you get the clever cat's ring usually which is what i do um, you don't really need to get the ladders you can just drop down and heal up with life gems because you get millions of them anyway so there's a few items here um, there's an item you need for one of the dlcs if you have the scholar of the first sin edition of the game uh, but not really much else in this pit The Grave of Saints is another very small area revolving around rats. There's a couple of enemy invasions here uh, and some Pharos lockstone that, that allow you to open certain small areas. Um, again, this is another really small area. It's an, another example of Dark Souls 2 just sort of having areas with title cards or you know, splitting one area into two areas just for some reason. Um, like this... This here, it's just the Grave of Saints, it's called, but I don't really know the law significance for this. The boss of this area is the Royal Rat Vanguard, which again is another example of Dark Souls 2 being weird. It's a room full of rats. There's about 20 rats, and one of the rats is like hidden. The, the, the main boss is a rat within this load of 20 rats, and that one rat, you literally just hit him twice and he dies. Um, it's a very easy boss. You'll never really die to this boss. And then afterwards you get access to the Rat King Covenant. Um, you need to get Rat Tails which increase your devotion to this Covenant. Um, and then you get different items for this. I think it's also a PvP one. You have to invade people to get Rat Tails, I think. It's an interesting idea, I suppose. Um, but it's not really great. This area is not really very good, again. So then we move on to the Gutter. The gutter is sort of like the blight town of Dark Souls 2 in terms of its architecture. Loads of wooden, almost shantytown looking buildings. Uh, you have to try and run across them. Except the gimmick here is not poison, it is darkness. The poison, well there is poison here as well. Actually you get shot from some uh, almost like mini turrets which are sort of shooting poison at you. And you have to try and dodge them or smash the turrets. Um, so there is poison here as well, but it's not as major an issue um, than it is in Blighton. It can be annoying, but poison doesn't last as long here. So usually you'll just have to use a life gem or two to sort of counter the poison, and then you'll be okay. And because life gems are so cheap, all it's really costing you is 600 souls if you get poisoned, which is not really that bad. Um, so the gutter is... I don't really like the idea that it's... I don't like that it's reusing this similar idea for the third time of this kind of same environment but at least it's doing it a little bit different the darkness concept here i like i do like the idea of darkness here it's very dark this area especially in the scholar of the first sin edition with the different lighting engine um and the, the idea is basically that as you go through this area it can be very confusing you don't really know where you're going you can get lost very easy um and the idea is that you like the sconces as you progress through which allows you more visibility because then if you die and come back you can see the sconces that you lit so you know the correct path and can then push through quicker. Uh, it did take me about six or seven attempts to get through this area on my recent playthrough because I kept falling off ladders that just went nowhere. That you just fell off a ladder and then it just went nowhere. Or I died from just, well, to be fair, I was getting quite frustrated at this section of the game. Um, but the thing is, is I got frustrated because, again, it's sort of doing a concept that I just find is frustrating, which is poison. Especially with these turrets where sometimes you can get poisoned even if you try and smash the turret. Or even if you try and dodge it because of the weird iframes in this game, you can still get hit with the poison. And I just don't find the, the mechanic of poison really very enjoyable in these games. I never have the same with Toxic and Scarlet Rot and, and all that. Um, but again, at least it has a decent gimmick with the darkness, which is executed in a decent way.
The gutter then leads to the Black Gulch, which is again basically a continuation of the Grave of Saints and the gutter. Except here we've reached the bottom of this area. There's now loads of those mini turrets. There's a really cool enemy here, which is like this black hand that comes out from this black oily goo. It looks really awesome. It's a fantastic enemy design. I absolutely love it. It's a shame it's frustrating because if you're too close to it, when it initially breaks out of the oil pit, it can grab you and just start munching on you, um, which sometimes can feel quite bullshit. But this area is basically one short run to a boss with loads of poison turrets. There's a couple of optional things for you to do here. You can speak to Lucatil again here. And then there is um, an area we'll talk about later where you can um, access Dark Lurker. And then there's two giants, which is an optional fight you have to do. Uh, again, it's almost like a mini boss fight, except here it's not a boss fight. It's quite strange, really. They call the Covetous Demon a boss. They call Proud Magus and Congregation a boss. They call the Royal Rat Vanguard a boss. But then these two giants here are not a boss. For some reason, it's quite strange. Maybe because they already had two giant bosses in the game. That could be the reason why. Um, that is really frustrating and, and very difficult to defeat those two giants in one go. But if you do it, you get quite a few rewards, which you need for various optional things you can do in the game. Then the main boss here is the Rotten. The problem with this is that there's, for some reason, there's an endlessly respawning invader here, which will always respawn every single time you go to the boss. So you try and run to go to the boss, He'll spawn in and it can be frustrating if you don't use the fragrant branch of your to get the second optional bonfire in this area, which makes the run to the boss a lot better. If you don't do that, if you don't have that fragrant branch of your, this can be really annoying. Having that invader constantly respawn over and over again, just never dying for some reason. I killed him three or four times and he still came back, which I don't quite. Maybe it was a glitch in my game because I've never had that happen in a Souls game before. Where the same invader constantly invades you every time. But, um, and the poison as well is really annoying when the mini turrets shoot. Because you're guaranteed to get poisoned on the run to the boss, which is also very annoying. The Rotten is not a hard boss, luckily. It's quite easy to beat, quite easy to get through. Um, he, I did actually die to him, I think, twice. Um, because I was just this one attack for some reason. When he did it, I just couldn't time the dodge properly. But then I got it and we're good. He's not a hard boss. The arena is quite annoying. There's a lot of fire in the arena, which you've got to try and step around, um, which I find a bit frustrating. But the boss is not too hard at all, and it's it's not that bad at all. And this is another one of the four great souls you need. This here, the Black Gulch, this Rotten. He is the third of the great souls that we need to progress to Dranglake Castle. Next, I'm going to talk about the healing mechanics of this game because Dark Souls 2 changed the healing mechanics for some reason. Dark Souls 1, in my opinion, and in many people's opinion, perfected the healing system. You get five Estus Flask charges in Dark Souls 1. No other way to heal. But then you can potentially use humanity to kindle a bonfire, which then makes you have more Estus Flasks for that one location, that one section of the game. And then when you get the right of kindling, you can do it again, kindle again, and kindle again to give yourself even more essence flasks for that one location, which is player-controlled difficulty. If you feel like you're struggling with an area, you can kindle the bonfire to give yourself more essence flask, which allows you to make more mistakes in that area. Dark Souls 2 just completely throws that whole system out the window. You start with one Essence Flask, and you need to find shards to basically fix the Essence Flask, which allows it to keep more Estus or the fire inside it, to allow you to use it more times. But instead it uses Life Gems. Life Gems slowly um, bring your health back. They slowly regenerate your health. But you can buy them for 300 souls, which is incredibly cheap. You can buy an infinite amount of them from a merchant, which is right by the bonfire and medulla. An infinite amount of life gems, an infinite amount of healing. The main thing you do in, in this game is level up using the souls you got from a boss, and the rest of the souls, the souls you have left over, use them to buy life gems. If you do that every single time you beat a boss, literally you have an infinite amount of life gems. You'll never run out of life gems. You can have 99 at all times. The idea, I think, and the concept was supposed to be, okay, Essence Flasks are your quick way to regenerate health. You can regenerate health quickly with Essence Flasks, but Life Gems, oh, they regenerate slower. But the problem is, you can use a Life Gem 
before you take damage. Let's say, okay, I'm I'm going to go and get reckless here. I'm going to go and just go balls to the wall, constantly right in the enemy's face, like the boss's face, just attacking him loads and loads and loads. Before I do that, I'll use three or four life gems. So my health is constantly going back really quickly. Then I can afford to go completely reckless because my health is constantly regenerating as I'm taking damage. Even if you just are playing more cautious, sometimes you can use a life gem just to top up your health, but then you get hit and then it keeps regenerating your health afterwards. Life gems are really powerful. They're insanely powerful, even though they're, they regenerate your health slowly, it doesn't really matter. And they're also great at countering poison, countering toxic, countering loads of things in the game. Life gems are absolutely broken. And in Dark Souls, having an infinite source of healing is just, it's just broken in general anyway. Because the idea of Essence Flasks was basically to give you a finite amount of mistakes that you can make in the boss or from the journey between one bonfire to another having life gems an infinite amount of them completely breaks that system and is just not really a very good idea and i i think it was a negative change and i think again dark souls 2 would be loads better if it just took dark souls 1 system and ran with that for the game instead So then, the Shaded Woods are an interesting area. It's another path that you can take from Majula. First of all, you have a woman who is petrified. You need to use a fragrant branch of your to unpetrify her, and then you can progress forward. Before this, we see a guy who has a Moonlight Great Sword. Um, if you remember that from Dark Souls 1 and Demon Souls, you'll immediately be thinking, how do I get that? Um, it's quite complicated to get it in this game, sadly. Um, there's a few of the basilisks, uh, which are really creepy and have really weird eyes, which freak me out. We keep pushing forward, then we get to a bonfire. From this bonfire, there are three paths you can take. Left, forward, or right. We are going to be going right for now. We will cover the other ways later, because right takes us to the shaded woods. First of all, we have a foggy forest, which is what the area should have been called, really, if this game was Mario or Zelda. Um... Here there's invisible enemies and some enemy trees, which are quite strange, but a decent concept. The invisible enemies at first, for some reason, when I first played this game, I thought they were really strong and I was really scared of them and I was running through the area and everything going crazy, but they're really easy to take down. I, I don't know why people, you know, whatever, struggle with these. I don't know why I did. Uh, the enemy trees, again, it, some, it, it freaks you out because you're thinking, oh, how did I get hit at first? Then when you realise that some of the trees damage you, it makes a lot more sense. This area then connects to the Shaded Ruins, which is... It's still technically Shaded Woods, but this is like the main area. It's, it looks very different to the Foggy Forest, but this is basically the main area. There's loads of cursed pots here. There's some, like, bugbear enemies, which are pretty interesting. They're the main enemy type here. They are a pretty decent enemy, actually. A pretty decent fight. Um, the cursed pots are something which... It's almost like they've been put there for players who play Dark Souls 1. Because if you play Dark Souls 1, you'll be freaking out, thinking, Oh my god, curse. I do not want to get cursed at all. But then when you realise that curse works very different in this game, and it just takes away your maximum health a little bit, it's nowhere near as bad. You don't get as scared, and you just recklessly roll through them all. And usually you don't even get cursed anyway, if you smash them fast enough. There's a few more fragrant branches of your here you've got to use to... Um, relieve people of petrification and then you can find a couple of nice chests and everything but this area is actually a bit pointless really there's a few more invisible enemies here which look like ghosts of other enemy or other players in other worlds which is a pretty decent idea and it does sort of uh, trick you a couple of times because you're thinking oh that's just another player in another world but then you realize oh no they're actually attacking me and then you freak out this area it's okay. It's another bridge area, really, to the main area, which is Brightstone Cove Seldora after this. There is a boss for this area, which I was quite surprised about because it's a very small area, really. Um, and that is Scorpioness Nashka, who is basically another version of Quelag, except she's half scorpion, half topless sexy woman. 
Um, she is okay. The gimmick of her is that she goes underneath the sand and then she jumps up from the sand to attack you, but there's a platform in the middle and if you run onto that platform, uh, she can't get you. So that's perfectly fine. But even then, she's not really that difficult at all. You can get quite a few hits on her right at the start because she starts off by being half buried in the ground. You can run straight up to her and whack her a few times, get a few hits and have a bit of a head start. She doesn't have much health like most bosses in Dark Souls 2. She's relatively easy. I beat a first try, so there's not really much to write home about here, sadly. So next up we have the Doors of Pharos. The Doors of Pharos is essentially a PvP area with a few items and a boss. The weird thing with this area is, first of all, you fight a couple of dwarves. I'm just going to call them dwarves because they have beards and they look like dwarves. And then suddenly all the enemies don't move and they're just stuck like statues. And this is the area where you can do PvP. If uh, you invade someone in this area, these enemies will then attack the player that you are invading. And you have to try and set up traps in a variety of ways using Pharos Lockstones uh, to activate certain traps, close certain doors and do things to try and stop the player that you are trying to kill essentially and try and make them die i haven't taken part in this so i cannot really comment on this very much but that's essentially the purpose this area serves but it also has a boss which is the royal rat authority i think this area has a boss just to try and give people an incentive to go here which then means that you have a chance to invade people the Royal Rat Authority is basically Sif from Dark Souls 1, except with absolutely no good story or emotion, and two rats which come right at the start and inflict toxic on you. So, for all intents and purposes, it's just a much weaker area. There's a few items in this area, but it's called the Doors of Pharos because there's absolutely loads of Pharos lockstones. Um... I haven't talked about uh, Ferris Lockstones. So basically this game has a second version of Illusory Walls. Which you need to go and put a lockstone in. So you get these little forest lockstones. And you put them into the door. And it opens an Illusory Wall. Essentially. That's what it does. This area is filled with them. There's absolutely dozens of them here. Just loads. Way too many. And um, there are a few decent items here. Which sometimes people will put orange glowing signs in front of the ones that have good good items but then some are completely worthless just have like a life gem in them or well, they might have another Faris lockstone so at least you didn't waste a Faris lockstone but um that's not the best this area is not very good at least it serves a purpose it's basically a pvp area um, but the boss isn't very good the gimmick isn't very good it's doesn't even look that visually appealing so yeah Next we have Brightstone Cove Cell Dora. So Brightstone Cove Cell Dora starts first of all, actually, before spiders, you have a really cool area actually. You come out to a little opening and there's almost like a campfire. And there's a lot of these hollow soldiers surrounding a campfire. Which is really cool. It's a really cool visual. It looks a bit different for Dark Souls. It looks a bit more like the real world, real life. Um where you've got some soldiers surrounding a bonfire and some almost like mini little tents you can kill these guys there's a few interesting items here there's a nice little um a well that you can actually break the top of and drop down into the well to get an item which is really cool uh, then you go down and that's where we have the proudly magus and congregation boss proudly magus and congregation are <laughs> they're a boss they are a boss apparently it's a room full of enemies and then the proudly magus who is this one guy almost like who the others are praying to it seems like um, it's just a room full of enemies. You just go in there and kill them all, and that's it. It's a boss. It has boss music for some reason, but it's a room full of enemies, and you kill them very easily. Yay. There's a few more necromancers in this area as well, and uh, some spiders, like I said, and some spider jockey guys. They're like these spiders that are attached to the back of these enemies. Uh, they're really weird. There's a similar enemy to them in Resident Evil, actually. Um... 
But they have a pretty decent design. Uh, they sort of are hinting at the boss of this area. Um, there's a bird here, which is one of the birds that we saw in the painted world of Ariamis in Dark Souls 1. Uh, if you free her in Earth and Peak, uh, not Earth and Peak, sorry. If you free her in the Shaded Woods, she sells boss weapons to you. But you have to sort of take a, a left path, a different path to the path, the path of the boss to get to her. There's this big sort of like sand pit in the middle of an area, which you can get pulled into which looks really cool. It's a really cool visual. And there's some interesting enemies here that you have to fight. Uh, the spiders are quite creepy if you have a fear of spiders, but they hint at the boss of the area, which we will sort of get to now. So you progress through the right-hand side of Brightstone Cove, Seldora, and then you open a big door, um, which sort of, so you're leaving this sort of deserty looking area, which is a different air looking area for Dark Souls 2. Brightstone Cove, Seldora, visually looks different which i like it has a different kind of visual to other areas that we've seen in the souls franchise but then we go to um we sort of start heading down and we encounter sort of more of a webby area which reminds me more of the armor spider from demon souls and that's basically what this boss is you get to the bottom of like a big web pit which is supposed to be this spider's lair and there's loads of spiders, loads more hollows, and then you get to the boss, which is basically the armor spider, except done a bit better. The armor spider only had three attacks that it could do, which meant the fighting it at first was really annoying because the attacks are quite frustrating and can you can very easily get stun locked basically from a few of those attacks and then end up taking a lot of damage. But once you know the armor spider's tells, it's a super easy boss fight. You can do it without even getting hit. This boss is really easy but at least it's a bit different it's got a bit of a different concept the idea here is that the spider has basically two heads which it keeps flipping between and if you keep running from one head to the other constantly back and forth back and forth you don't really get damaged so you just keep running back and forth back and forth it's almost like a trick once you know how to do it and once you know to do it you can beat this boss really easily but if you don't know to do it and you just stay in front of one of the spider's heads then you could take quite a bit of damage and suddenly it's a bit harder, but at least it's got a bit of a gimmick. The gimmick having the two heads makes it a bit different to the armor spider because for all intents and purposes, it's just a new version of the armor spider. Then we technically go to a new area after you've beaten this, which is called the Lord's Private Chamber, which is literally a room. It's called the Lord's Private Chamber because it's literally just a chamber and then a bonfire. For some reason, it's got a title card. The game introduces it like it's a new area, and then you just teleport away from it. Um, weird. But anyway, that is the Brightstone Cove Saldora. That is the fourth boss soul that we need. And then we go back to the Shaded Woods. But before we go back to the Shaded Woods to make our way to Drang Lake Castle, we need to talk about the weapon upgrade system in Dark Souls 2, because around this part in the game, you will probably have upgraded your weapon. Now, there's a big difference with Dark Souls 2 as compared to the original game. In Dark Souls 2, you infuse weapons with elemental properties already present. For example, if you have a weapon that has a certain elemental property, like the Hide Knight Sword, you can still convert it to the Dark Hide Knight Sword, which is one of the upgrade paths you can take a weapon down in this game, which means that it still deals lightning damage, like the original weapon does, but then it also gives dark damage on top of that. So regularly you'll reinforce your weapon to like plus one, then plus two, then plus three, then plus four, all the way up to plus 10 for a regular weapon. Then uh, boss weapons can only be increased up to plus five and they increase by 30% damage for each upgrade. Whereas a regular uh, reinforcing a weapon in a regular way increases damage by plus 10% for each upgrade. So if you upgrade a weapon to plus one, it gets 10% bonus damage all the way up to plus 10, where it's 100% bonus damage. Boss weapons uh, increase by 30% per upgrade rather than 10%, but then stop at plus five. Infusion is the main upgrade mechanic of this game, whereas in Dark Souls 1, you take weapons down different paths. You take them down the raw path, the dark path, 
Uh, in this game, you infuse weapons, so you add almost like a crystal to these weapons, which makes them do something different. So it changes the upgrade system drastically. So first of all, we have the Magic Path, which reduces physical damage as well as strength and dexterity scaling, but improves magic scaling and adds magic damage. There's the Fire Path, which reduces physical damage as well as strength and dex, but it improves fire scaling and fire damage. Lightning is the same, but it improves lightning and lightning damage. Dark is the same as well, but improves dark and dark damage. Then Poison is quite effective on weapons that already have a poison effect, but not as much without it. It does reduce the base damage and scaling, but it adds a poison effect. It's quite a different playstyle using poison weapons. Bleed is very similar, it increases the bleed and builds up bleed quickly. Then there's Raw, which works the same in Dark Souls 1. It upgrades your base weapon physical power and it decreases the stat scaling, but it can still be enchanted with other temporary weapon effects, which can still make it quite powerful. Enchanted is then another version of magic in a way. It reduces strength, dex, fire, lightning, and dark scaling all the way down to D or E, and then it adds an initial D magic scaling as well. It doesn't affect the base damage though, which is the main thing here, and it makes physical damage, not magic damage, scale with intelligence. So it's quite interesting how they changed Enchanted in this game. Then there's Mundane, which is quite strange. It's like a gimmick. Mundane weapons upgrade your weapons to scale with your lowest stat. So instead of your... So usually you'd want a weapon to upgrade with the statistic that you're going to be putting the most points into. Mundane is the opposite. So instead it means it's, it scales with your lowest one. But then it decreases the weapon's base damage by 50% and decreases the overall stat scaling. It's best use if you're going to be upgrading all your stats equally that's the best way to do this is the best way to sort of get the most out of this um, and they can be quite powerful if you do that uh, and it's really good for weapons that have low base damage or don't have any real scaling at all so it's pretty good for those kind of things so then next we're going to be moving on to the shrine of winter slash drang lake castle uh, we continue from the left-hand path this time from the Shaded Woods, and this will take us to the Shrine of Winter. There's a few hollow soldiers on the way there, not really too much to write home about. And then you reach the Shrine of Winter, which is the way to get to one of the DLCs, and it serves no other purpose really, except if you try and get here early in the game, you can't go past it. Um, there's stuff blocking your way, and then you open a path to go around by beating the four other Great Lord Souls, um, the Great Lords which we just beat in the previous sections. Or if you acquire one million cumulative souls, which means a million souls from just defeating other enemies and you get a million souls doing that, then you can progress forward without beating those four big bosses. From here, then, we reach Drang Lake Castle. Here we have one of those strange, weird moments I mentioned earlier, where the whole lighting and skybox and everything just changes when you go through a small tunnel. And that's where you reach Drang Lake Castle. There's quite a big gap here with no bonfire, actually. This is probably the biggest gap in the game where there is no bonfire, which I do quite like. Ironically, it's more the other way. I feel like it's actually too big a gap, strangely enough. Um, in Dark Souls 1, there probably would have been a bonfire a little bit earlier here. But still, there's nothing wrong with this. I appreciate the difficulty and the challenge. Uh, we encounter some mammoth enemies who are like big mammoth soldiers. There was one of them earlier in the game in the Doors of Pharos. Um, they're pretty decent enemies. Uh, pushing forward then, we encounter the first um, soul box, essentially. Uh, that's what is a soul box from... Um, Call of Duty Zombies, where it's like a giant and you have to kill enemies to feed souls to it, which then allows it to open the path forward. Um, then pushing forward more, we have some pretty decent enemies with swords and shields. Uh, they block a few other areas, so you might have encountered them earlier in the game. There's one of them in the Forest of Fallen Giants, for example, and one of them blocking a different path from the Shaded Woods, which we'll get to later, the way to Aldeus Keep. Um, these enemies are pretty decent fights, actually. They, are. they have a big sword, big shield. They're quite powerful, have a decent amount of health, but you can take them down not too badly if you know what you're doing. Then we get access to the main Drang Lake Castle area. Drang Lake Castle proper. 
there's a NPC here who you can talk to when he gives us a bit of lore and story information. Pushing further past him, we get some more sword and shield enemies. And this area looks really good. I will say this, Drang Lake Castle visually looks stunning inside and outside. It's basically the Anor Londo of this game. The big moment around the halfway point of the game where you're thinking, wow, this game looks good. Uh, this section looks very good. Aesthetically, it looks really cool. And I have no complaints about Dragon Lake Castle, really, to be honest. We get our first bonfire then inside. And then we get some more of these sort of giant soul boxes, which is what I'm going to call them. We have to feed some souls to a giant uh, who then lights up an area. And then you have to feed souls to giant doors. Like these giants have been sort of painted on doors. And you have to then fill souls to open these doors to progress further. There's eight doors and you have to try and find which one is the correct path to move forward. Uh, there's some more standard hollow enemies here, some sort of hollow soldiers, except in a different kind of armor. Pretty simple enemies to fight. Some of them have bows and arrows, some of them have regular swords. We saw a few of them earlier in the game as well, in the Forest of Fallen Giants as well. Um, and then we get to going along, um, we get another pretty decent sized gap uh, without a bonfire, but there's a hidden bonfire. Uh, around here as well uh, past that first bonfire when we go to sort of some of the outside areas of Dragon Lake Castle going along sort of the rooftops um, then we get to the twin dragon riders boss fight um, shortly after speaking to Nishandra Nishandra seems to be sort of like the queen or the princess of this area Dragon Lake Castle and uh, she talks to you very briefly before disappearing and then afterwards we get to the twin dragon riders which is Another weird boss for Dark Souls 2, it's two Dragon Riders. So earlier in the game we had the Dragon Rider fight, who can potentially be the first boss you fight in the game. Here we have two Dragon Riders. One of them is shooting arrows at you first of all, before joining the fight after a couple of minutes, uh, while you fight the first one. Uh, it's okay, it's alright. They've got a lot more health, which I appreciate, at least they tried to up the difficulty a little bit. But they're still pretty easy. I still beat them on my first go. Which I don't really like in Dark Souls 2. There's too many bosses here that I beat on my first try. I think in Dark Souls it should have a bit more difficulty. You should at least die a couple of times to a boss before you manage to progress, you know. But these it's still a decent fight. It's okay. And then we get the second sort of section of Dragon Lake Castle where we light into the bonfire. And there's a couple of paths that you can go down here. Uh, but they all connect to the same place. The same path. Uh, and then it allows you, so you go, you encounter a few of the desert sorceresses that we encountered earlier, um, which are quite strong. And there's a strange woman who is trapped in a cell that is blocked by a weird creature with no arms or legs that's like chained to it. It looks really strange, but that's an NPC that we'll sort of talk more about a little bit later in the video. In this room, you get the key to the King's Passage, which then, if you go back down, opens a door which takes you to the King's Passage, which is technically a, a separate area, but we're going to carry on talking about it in the Dragon Lake Castle section. This King's Passage then takes you to the Looking Glass Knight boss fight, which is one of the most iconic boss fights in Dark Souls 2, to be honest. It's a very interesting fight. It's, it's sort of a cross between the Undead Monk and then... A regular sword and shield opponent um, because he looks really cool he has a really awesome sword and he has this mirror which he uses as a shield and he can use this mirror to summon an NPC just like the old monk it's an interesting concept and gimmick that I do find pretty cool sometimes it's like a one-off but I think the series sort of did it a few too many times after this as well for it to sort of be very I mean it's okay it does it a few times but I think it takes a little bit away from this encounter. This encounter would be absolutely awesome if it was just the one boss, no possible invader, and it's just him being really strong. Sort of like the Fume Knight later on, because aesthetically this guy's got it down, but in terms of the actual gameplay, he himself is a little bit too easy, really, in my personal opinion. I'd have liked to have seen him be a little bit more like the Fume Knight. He could be like a proper tough fight you have to try and get through to get access to the rest of the game afterwards a bit of a, a roadblock i'd have loved that if he was like the ornstein and smo of this game being in you know ornstein and smo in Alondo, looking glass knight is in dragon lake castle he could be like artorius level difficulty but 
Unfortunately, that's not what the game went for, but it still is a decent fight and I do quite enjoy it in its own merit. After this, then, we have the Shrine of Amana, which for many people is the worst area of Dark Souls 2, which I can understand. There's absolutely loads of casters who are just shooting magic at you constantly over and over and over again. And when you go to try and take one out, there's another one which is sort of, which will then start shooting at you when you try and defeat that one, and then over and over and over again. You've got to try and find, you have to try and tactically and methodically clear this area out very slowly, judging where each enemy is, looking for where the others are, and when they'll be able to shoot at you. It's annoying because the problem is, is that if you get halfway through and then die, you're tempted to go and rush back through. And try and run past them or clear them out quickly that's not what you want to do here you have to go slow tactical and methodical that's the only way you'll be able to get through this area successfully the boss of this area is the demon of song which is okay it looks weird it's another one that's very easy um its attacks are very very slow and predictable it only has about three or four attacks so you can beat it pretty quickly <clears throat> It doesn't take long to learn this boss, and you can get past it very quickly. This whole area is just a very linear, one linear stretch with loads of casters you've got to try and dodge and take out. And then a boss which is very average at best, and then afterwards we get the Undead Crypt. The Undead Crypt is then another area which is sort of you've been building up to a bit like Drang Lake Castle this is where King Vendrick is who the guys are building up to I think I would have expected him to be in Drang Lake Castle but he's here instead okay this is around the part where I feel like the game was sort of overstaying its welcome a little bit I feel like the areas from this point onwards are not very good they feel unfinished they're too linear they don't really have good level design this is where the game overstayed its welcome a little bit. If the areas here had been better, with better level design, I'd have been okay with it, because it would have felt like, okay, we're getting good levels here at least, even though the game's a little bit longer than Dark Souls 1, it still has good level design and everything, but unfortunately, this area is not really as good. It's got a decent gimmick, but again, it's super linear. You just walk forward. There's a few big twin shield soldiers, which are pretty decent. Uh, they got a good gimmick to having the two shields, which sort of look like doors. You go up to them and then they try and attack you. They have weird hitboxes, which can be a bit bullshit sometimes, but visually they're okay. And then uh, you push through further, and there's some really annoying uh, dark soldiers, uh, sorry, dark witches which shoot dark magic at you and hexes and things, which can be a bit tricky to get past. But once you got past there, then... We start to sort of encounter the gimmick of this main section here, which is sort of these pyromancers, or they are pyromancers, I think they're like necro pyromancers, that's what they're like, and you have to try and smash their gravestones, otherwise they'll keep coming back, so you have to kill these necro pyromancers, and then quickly smash their gravestones, all the while trying to stop skeletons from ringing bells because when they ring the bells they wake up all of the necropyromancers in this location and they'll all be attacking you and you just basically die instantly so you have to stop the skeletons from attacking the bells whilst you're blocked by loads of gravestones just blocking your path which you have to smash you can accidentally ring the bells yourself and then alert the necropyromancers this area it's got a good gimmick but again it it's done in a frustrating way you got to try and clear them out but then you could accidentally ring them by yourself which is frustrating i don't think this gimmick is done very well if there's a bit more space and if they sort of introduced the gimmick slowly and then played on it for a while in different ways with a little bit more space to maybe do a bit more like the catacombs in dark souls one if you do it like that, I think it could have been done better. I just don't think the concept was done very well here. And it doesn't even play on the gimmick very long either. So there's a decent shortcut here though, where after you've completed the section, you can pull a lever and then it drops a bridge down, which is a decent shortcut to an earlier bonfire. And then you have the run up to the next boss fight, which is Velstat. The problem again is the run up to this boss. The run-up is frustrating because you've got some of these necropyromancers, you've got skeletons which deliberately ring the bell, then you've got two of the um, 
knights with shields and swords which were blocking some of the king's doors earlier in the game and then you've got a dragon rider so you've got one dra one of the dragon riders which is pretty much a boss in himself essentially he's not too hard and luckily he doesn't respawn but still the run-up is a little bit too excessive for my liking but Velstat's a decent fight you shouldn't really die to him too many times anyway but I did on my first playthrough but he's not that hard he could be harder he's a decent fight he's a good sort of sword and shield opponent um but the problem again that I, I I have with a lot of these fights is the life gems just break the fight essentially I think after this or maybe when I've gone through all the games again I might go back and play Dark Souls 2 without life gems just use the SS flasks because life gems completely make any sense of threat that any of the bosses have just eliminated because here it's like oh I'm struggling a little bit I'll just bomb a few life gems up and then suddenly you're okay just run across the arena use a life gem the boss can't get you get your health back up full again and go crazy Phil stats a decent fight though he's a pretty good fight he's got decent law significance because he is here defending Vendrick and he has for, for hundreds of years probably been defending Vendrick and guarding him from anybody that's potentially trying to stop him or kill him he could have been again like an Artorius fight but he's just not there the Fume Knight does this again really well. I think this, it, this, if the if they wanted to do the invasion mechanic with the Looking Glass Knight, they should have made Velstat like that big blockade, the big wall you got to get past to access the rest of the game. They should have made him like that, but sadly, they didn't. He's difficult by Dark Souls 2 standards, but not really that difficult by Dark Souls overall standards. So, sadly, he's not quite as good as he could have been. After this, we have Vendrick. Here, you've heard about this king for your entire time in the game. You go down these stairs, you expect a boss fight, you expect something awesome, some epic moment, and then sadly, Vendrick has gone hollow. He's taken off his clothes and he's just walking in circles around the room, dragging his sword across the floor behind him, and he's just lost. He's just lost it. It's quite a sad moment. It's quite a one of the best moments in Dark Souls 2, probably. Sad music plays. And you realise this king you've heard so much about is just a shadow of his former self. And then, then you get the king's ring, which allows you to access certain areas that we couldn't access earlier in the game. But before we talk about those, we need to talk about covenants in this game. Dark Souls 2 expands on the Covenant system that we saw in Dark Souls 1. Here there are 9 Covenants and they have slightly different mechanics. Some are PvP, some are PvE. Uh, we will delve into the PvP ones first. So first of all you have the Bell Keepers, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, invade players in the Belfry Luna and Belfry Soul areas as a great spirit. So that's what you do. You can invade these areas and try and stop players from bringing the bells. That's what that does. It's a decent concept, a decent unique gimmick. Then you have the Blue Sentinels, which assist players that are in the way of the Blue Covenant if they are invaded as a Blue Spirit and invade players who have acquired Sin. So you need to invade the players who have Sin, so you're sort of like a force for good. And you need to assist people who are in the way of the Blue Covenant. You are there to defend them. Then there's the Brotherhood of Blood, which is just an invasion covenant. You just invade other players as a red spirit. There's the Rat King Covenant, which I mentioned earlier. So if you're in Grave of Saints or Doors of Pharos, you can draw players who have entered the corresponding area into your world. So you draw them into your world, and then you are stopping them by using Pharos Lockstones and the enemies that are there to try and stop them. Then we have the Dragon Remnants. Here you rank up by fighting other players as a summoned phantom and you become more draconic as the that's the description that's the official description become more draconic as you rank up and gain special abilities so it's a decent idea you just fight this it's just like a fighting covenant really you just fight and and fight and fight then there's the way of blue which is uh, this is the one where you summon blue sentinel covenant players to your world when you've been invaded so this is sort of like the safety covenant if you don't want to be invaded you join the way of blue and then you'll get help if you ever do get invaded then we have the pve ones uh two pve ones actually in one cup i'll do the co-op one first which is the heirs of the sun it's basically 
it's just Solaire, basically. Solaire's Covenant. <laughs> Participate in Jolly Corporation. It means your summon sign is a gold summon sign, and you rank up by helping other people defeat bosses. So this is the one to help other people, so it's a nice one. Then there's a the company of champions, which increases the game's difficulty by taking away all corp functionality, and it increases enemies' and bosses' strength and health, so it just makes the game generally harder for you. Then finally, there is the Pilgrims of Dark, which we'll talk more about later, which allows you to delve into ancient abyss dungeons and conquer them to earn powerful and dark rewards, as well as having an exclusive boss fight, which we'll talk more about later. So the Covenant system was expanded upon here. The main interesting ones, I think, is the Company of Champions and the Pilgrims of Dark, because they do some interesting things with the gameplay. Company of Champions is basically an even harder mode, which I love. It's awesome. It's great having that in the game. Just built into the game as a, as a thing you can choose to do whenever you want and opt out of it whenever you want as well. And the Pilgrims of the Dark is a covenant which gives you access to extra areas and extra content and extra boss and extra boss, which is really cool. I love it. Um, I do wish that the later games expanded on that even more by giving you even more side content to do if you join certain covenants, but Dark Souls 3 sort of took a step back in that area, sadly. But anyway, let's carry on with our playthrough then. Next we move on to Aldia's Keep. Aldia's Keep is an area that at the beginning looks very good. It looks majestic. It looks beautiful. It looks like it can make an awesome set piece for a Dark Souls area. You walk in and it's almost like you walk into the Natural History Museum in London. There's just a giant dragon skeleton that's being displayed sort of like a museum. That's what it looks like to me anyway. And that's sort of the concept of this area is that things are being kept in cages so like a collection you've got paintings on the walls you go down and there's rooms to the left and to the right and almost like a laboratory area and then a little pit area and then that's the gimmick of this area at the beginning you've got creatures that sort of break out of glass paintings on the walls which is really cool it's a cool gimmick or is it mirrors they break out of? They might break out of mirrors. They might be reusing the looking glass night concept. I think I think that's what it is. They break out of mirrors um, on the walls. And it's cool. It looks decent. But I think in, in terms of the actual gameplay, it's not really very fun. Once you get past the initial room with the dragon um, being displayed, you get to the main corridor, which is basically just a long corridor with enemies that just jump out at you these big giant ogre creatures that look like big babies jump out at you there's one room which has like a poison pit which just saps the durability from your weapons and your armor and i just i think this could have been a really cool idea if they'd played into this the way they played into the duke's archive make it a sprawling building where experiments are being conducted on different creatures and different animals you've got some like weird um creatures that have been merged together so they're like breeding two different types of creatures to see what they can make this could have been a really cool area if that actually played into the level design better made it a massive area with four floors that connect down to each other in really cool and unique ways have like secret um shortcuts behind these paintings and mirrors where you can pull a lever and it opens one of them that would have been really cool there's so much potential in this area but sadly it was just rushed that's what it feels like with this area it was rushed the boss fight at the end as well is weak it's the guardian dragon it's just a beat it first go and coming after because this is the first dragon fight after calamite um it's a disappointment really it's super easy doesn't really take much to beat it and you can get past it really it doesn't have much health either and these enemies are then used in the next area as regular enemies so i don't understand why this is a boss so then after this you go to the dragon airy which is that area where they reuse the guardian dragon it's basically floating islands in the sky with loads of dragons around it's cool visually it looks very cool, but it doesn't have much to it gameplay-wise. There's lots of connected floating islands. You've got to try and figure out the best path to get to the next area. It, again, it's just a short little almost bridge area. you just got to try and... Like, there's lots of optional ways you can go. Optional caves, uh, optional fights with dragons, which can reward you. But again, 
if you want to just go to the next area quickly and not get that side optional stuff, which you don't really have to, you could go through this area in about two minutes, literally, which is very disappointing. And the main enemy here is the dragons, which are reused. They also reuse some of the enemies from the Lost Bastille, the exploding enemies. So they're just, this again, it feels like a rushed area. This section of the game feels rushed to me. They're reusing enemies here in, in and it just, like, reusing the Guardian Dragon takes away from the Guardian Dragon fight we just did a couple of minutes ago. Then reusing the enemies from the Lost Bastille, why are they here? There's no real reason for those specific prisoners to be here in the Dragon Airy. It's quite strange. And I think, again, it just feels like this is a great concept. And if they'd really flesh this area out, it could have been really cool. But sadly, it's just wasted potential. Sadly. Next we have the Dragon Shrine, which is essentially the second part of the Dragon Airy, except now it's actually more buildings and, you know, sword and shield enemies. We have more of the giants being reused from Hyde's Tower of Flame, except now they have different weapons and they don't have a shield. Um, they have like a mace um, and they reuse movesets from other enemies we've seen previously. One of them re uh, has a club and they use some of the, the moves from the Asylum Demon from Dark Souls 1. They use some of those moves because they're using the same weapon. Um, and these enemies have a lot of health. They're much more difficult than the ones in Hyde's Tower of Flame, but they're decent fights. I don't mind fighting these guys, but it does seem like they are beginning to do something. Dark Souls 3 would do a lot more where enemies seem to have infinite stamina, where they can just attack and attack and attack constantly, and they don't need to take time to sort of recover between their attacks, which is something that, as I said, Dark Souls 3 ends up doing loads in the next game. But... This is sort of the first time we sort of see that, where it seems like they can attack loads without ever giving you really an option, or an, sorry, an opportunity to attack them, which is a bit disappointing. Um, the giants are the main enemies here. There's a lot of optional dragon, um, I don't know what we'd call them really there, just dragon guards, dragon keepers, I don't know. But they're sort of like mini dragon slayers. Basically, that's what they are. They're like mini dragon slayers, but they're super powerful. They're really strong. They they have absolutely loads of health, can deal absolutely loads of damage, and attack really quickly. But they sort of play with like a respect thing. So if you defeat the giants, if you take the time to defeat the giants, they allow you to go past them without wanting to attack you. But if you try and run past the giants, it's seen as sort of being not honorable. So therefore, they come and run and try and attack you. All of them in one go. Like every single one of them will come and attack you. And there can be like 20 of them at some points here. All will attack you at once. Because they want you just to sort of go through the area and fight the enemies to get to the destination here. So you go past a few of these giants. And then we have one of these mini dragon slayers on steroids. They are absolutely crazy. He's got... He's power stancing two weapons which do absolutely loads of damage. And he's basically almost the boss, like the captain of the mini dragon slayer. That's what I'm going to call it. The mini dragon slayer captain. That's my name for him. He's insane. He's stronger than some of the bosses in this game. He killed me about five or six times. And the problem is you have to go through and clear all these enemies out again to get to him. Because you can't rush past them because you'll get absolutely destroyed by the mini dragon slayers. So you have to defeat every single enemy here that's required. After you've beaten this guy, which takes a long time, then we reach a optional boss. So here you get to the ancient dragon and he gives you the Ashen Mist Heart, which allows you to go into the memories of various deceased creatures in the world. Usually giants, but there's also one dragon that you can go into the memories of. And that then allows you to potentially beat Vendrick and all sorts of things. Or obviously at this point you can beat the game if you wanted to, um, after you've beaten the dragon, the, the giant lord. Or if you want to, you can potentially attack this guy after you've got the Ashen Mist Heart and then try and beat him. This boss fight, if you try and attack this guy and, and, and try and beat him, he has absolutely loads of health. The main obstacle here is durability because beating this guy, I it broke two of my weapons and I managed to beat him on the third weapon. So that's what we're talking about here. Either bring in loads of repair powder or be ready with a couple of weapons because he absolutely, he has so much health. It takes a really long time to beat him. 
But the problem is, is that it's not a, a very good fight because it takes a while to beat him, but you can really easily exploit his attacks and get into a strategy where you can just sort of go move from his right foot, his front right foot, or, you know, when you're going in, the foot that's on the right side, and then run to his tail, and then go back to that foot, then go back to his tail, go back to the foot, attack a couple of times, go back to the tail, go back to the foot, attack a couple of times, go back to the tail. Do this over and over again, and he just does the same attacks over and over again on repeat, So, which means that you can exploit his AI and defeat him really easily. But he has loads of health. It's meant to be almost like punishing you for attacking such a majestic creature that's passive and, and doesn't really want to kill you. It's punishing you for that, which is why it's got so much health. But the problem is, it's a really easy fight once you know how to exploit the AI. Anyway, after this, I'm going to briefly cover the memories that you can access. There's the memory of Vamar, the memory of Oro, the memory of Jay, and the Dragon memory. So there's four different memories that you can access here. All of them are pretty bad. Now, from a concept, a visual concept, it seems okay. You're going back in past to see the war between the giants and the you know, forest of fallen giants, essentially. Um, you know, the castle people that were there, the hollows that were there. And you're going back to see this happening, which is an interesting idea. And then you have to go and get these different souls from giants, which allows you to potentially fight Vendrick after you've got all of the different souls of giants. Okay, decent concept, but they're very linear. And they're just boring gameplay-wise. The enemies are not very interesting to fight. For some reason, you can backstab the giants, even though they're absolutely massive. There's no good items here. There's nothing really. There's no even decent lore that you get because there's no items to give you lore, really. But you need these to fight Vendrick. There's also a giant lord boss fight in one of these, which is reusing the last giant boss fight, except with a sword now instead of his other weapon. Um, which, okay, you know, he's got a couple of different moves, but it's basically the same thing. Beat him very easily. He's got slightly more health, but he's a very easy boss fight. And there's not really much to write home about here, really, sadly. Once you've acquired all of the different uh, giant souls that you can get, you can take on Vendrick. Now, normally Vendrick, his health is multiplied by 32 if you go and fight him without getting any of the souls of giants, which means that... It take, it's already tough, but it multiplies his health by 32 times, meaning it's basically impossible to beat him unless you're an absolute god at the game if you have not got the souls of giants. If you get one soul of a giant, it reduces that down to 16 times multiplying his health. If you have two, it takes it down to eight times multi multiplying his health. If you get three, it takes it down to four. If you get four, it takes it down to two times his health. And if you have all of the souls of a giant, the last one is acquired by the ancient dragon. If you have all five souls of a giant, then it takes his health down to one time. So the regular health that he normally has. This is a decent idea. I actually like this idea. I think it's a good idea. Sort of meaning that you don't have to get all the different stuff, but you sort of can pick and choose which souls of giants you want to get to beat Vendrick, which then allows you to properly beat the game. Because beating Vendrick is a prerequisite for beating the game properly and getting to defeat Nishandra. The boss fight's okay. He deals a lot of damage. He's very slow, very predictable. His moves are well telegraphed, but he deals a lot of damage. So if you do get hit by him, it's punishing but his moves are pretty okay. He's not really too bad a fight. I beat him, I think, on the second go on my recent playthrough. So he's not too tough really at all once you've actually got the souls. But he can potentially be very punishing if you are potentially doing a slower build and you, and you don't have time to get out of the way as much. It can potentially be quite punishing. So next we're going to talk about the character quests in this game. Now, there's a lot less character quests in Dark Souls 2, and the characters don't really move around the world the way they do in Dark Souls 1 to tell their stories. Um, usually, 
they just might go like there's only a couple that actually move from place to place whereas in dark souls one there was loads of people moving all over the place and it felt like they were doing their own things they had their own missions they were going on whilst you were exploring the world they were doing their own things then you just happened to run into them at certain places whereas in dark souls 2 the majority of characters you meet them once then they go back to medulla maybe give you an item if you give them something but there's only real two exceptions to this which we're going to talk about now so First of all, we have Benhart of Jugo. Benhart is a warrior from the land of Jugo, which is a land filled with corrosive ants and honorable fighting men. He's traveled from land to land and then he reaches Drang Lake and he says he's on a mission to perfect his swordsmanship. Now, if you want to complete his quest, you need to talk to him in all of his locations, which is the entrance to the Shaded Woods. You also need to summon him for three boss fights and he needs to be alive when the the fight ends if he dies you need to basically kill yourself or use a homeward bone to go out of there to potentially retry this i don't like this idea where you like you have to keep these people alive during the entire fight because it's hard a lot of the time they do stupid things and get themselves killed and it's not fun trying to protect the computer control characters from doing stupid things themselves it's very frustrating but sadly that's how you do the quests in this game you have to keep them alive during all the boss fights the other one is lucatil of mirror the only other one really of note uh, lucatil is from the land of mirror a place where only those who can fight are honored she was born as a peasant along with her brother rose to a rank of knighthood and then she and her brother had a rivalry but she admits of all the times they fought she never actually managed to beat him Lucatil and her brother, they're a bit different on the battlefield as Mira is constantly beset by conflict and were knighted into Mira's official order. This questline is very similar to Ben Hart's. You need to go and find and exhaust her dialogue at different locations whilst also summoning her to defeat three bosses. And the same as Ben Hart, she needs to be alive when the boss dies for it to count. This whole system is a massive downgrade from Dark Souls 1, which in Dark Souls 1, as I said, it felt like a real world. Characters were doing their own things. But in Dark Souls 2, it's like, that doesn't really happen, except with these two exceptions, Lucatil and Benhart are the only sort of, they're the only real remnants of that kind of system from Dark Souls 1, which is very disappointing, really, for, to me. Because it was one of the best parts of Dark Souls 1. It did, it felt like you were in a living, breathing world because of a combination of the level and world design as well as these characters doing their own things and it was a great way to tell these character stories because unless you actually knew what to do and where to go you would just encounter them every now and again and then you get little bits of their stories but then you might end up seeing them die because you weren't there to protect them and then it makes you want to go back again to help them and it really did massively boost the narrative and the small little side quests of the game luckily elden ring and dark souls 3 would bring this system back and make it much more like dark souls 1 luckily thank god for that next i'm going to speak about the optional content in dark souls 2 which is one thing the dark chasms of old because dark souls 2 does not have anywhere near as much in the way of optional content compared to dark souls 1 dark souls 1 had the great hollow and ash lake it had the painted world of ariamis the potential optional thing you could do of going back to the starting area northern undead asylum an optional boss fight with gwendolyn there was a lot of optional content which you had to do very specific things to be able to unlock and massive areas which were gated away from the player unless you did certain things which i really liked because it meant that once you beated the game you could then go and look and think oh what did i miss then usually there was loads of things that you just missed them which then encourages repeated playthroughs dark souls 2 the only thing you have here is the dark chasms of old which you get access to if you find this one specific character in three hidden places in the world which are usually very hard to find and you wouldn't even think to go to those locations or even think there was a location there unless you looked up a guide online so you need to meet this guy three times in three different places then afterwards he will then open these three different dark chasms you then need to go and clear out all the enemies and light a flame inside these three dark chasms of old 
then you get access to an optional boss fight, which is one of, if not the best, fights in the game. These three Dark Chasms, though, are nowhere near as good. They are literally just small, linear caves with a couple of NPC characters in them, which don't really make much sense, because one of them looks like Havel, one of them looks like someone else from another game. It's weird, but they're very difficult. Um, getting through them can be potentially frustrating, because you have to use a humanity every single time you want to go into these areas, which is also really punishing. Having to use a humanity or a human effigy in this game every time you want to attempt one of these. Um, but then once you've done all three of them, they're again just very short caves with just a few NPCs. Not much to talk about really in them. Then once you beat all of them, you get Dark Lurker. And the problem is every time you want to fight Dark Lurker, you have to battle through one of the Chasms of Old. You can pick which one. Because no matter which one you pick, Dark Luck will be at the end as a boss fight once you've cleared all three of them out. So you can sort of pick which one you think you find the easiest. I found the Shaded Woods one the easiest to get through. Um, just because the enemies were pretty easy there. You didn't have to beat Havel. A lot of people say Dragon Lake Castle is the easiest one because it's right by a bonfire. But I found the extra run from the bonfire was okay because the actual chasm itself was... Um, I found easier than having to be Havel every time. Um, so I found the Shaded Woods one was easier for me and my playstyle. And then getting through there though, every single time to beat Dark Looker is frustrating, especially because you always have to use a human effigy every single time as well. And sometimes you can get invaded, sometimes something stupid can happen, you could fall into a pit or something, which can be very annoying. And then you waste that human effigy and basically waste about 10 minutes of your time. Which can be really annoying. But Dark Luck himself is a really cool fight. He is very difficult. Um, but not at first. That's the thing. Not at first. First of all, you're thinking, okay, he's got a few moves. Yes, they deal a lot of damage. But it's not really that hard to actually take health off him. Then you get halfway through the fight. And realize that that's the gimmick of the fight. Dark Lurker splits himself into two. And then you've got two versions of Dark Lurker. Which are both doing their own attacks. And you have to try and balance that and try and dodge both of them you know, and attack one of them while keeping an eye on what the other one's doing. And it can get really crazy. One of the best strategies I found is once he initially splits in two, both parts of Dark Luck are right next to each other. So then I just tanked it and damaged as, like dealt as much damage to them both at the same time as I possibly could. Because they're both right next to each other. So my attacks damaged both of them, which meant I was essentially doing double damage. That's the best strategy I found. That's how I ended up defeating Dark Lurker. Um, but it's a really cool fight. I've definitely the best fight in the game. It's just a shame that there's a massive trek to try and challenge him every single time. If you could just spawn right in the arena, or the bon the bon there was a bonfire right outside it, You'd be perfectly fine. But it's having to go through that chasm and use a human effigy every single time is really frustrating. So, also, you can only fight him once, as far as I'm aware. You can't use a bonfire effigy to resurrect him like you can the other bosses in the game. Next, we're going to start talking about the DLCs then. So first we have Shulva, the Sanctum City. This is a pretty well-designed area, and it's got a really good gimmick. So the gimmick is you've got to shoot these pillars, and these pillars will raise and lower certain platforms. Later on, you've got to shoot certain buttons, which open certain doors. So you're actually using a bow here. Um, you can whack early ones with a sword, but later on, there's, there's later ones you can only actually hit if you have a bow. Which is pretty cool. It's the only real time where the Souls games have actually really pushed for you to be using a ranged weapon. Which is pretty different for the Souls games. This area, again, it's got really good level design. Lots of shortcuts which go back up. Like lifts which you can access which take you back up to an earlier bonfire. Ways in which the level connects which you wouldn't initially expect. It's really cool. It's a massive area as well. So I couldn't really go through and walk through the entire thing because... It's a huge area. It's a very. I think it's the biggest of the DLCs for me. Anyway, it felt like it. It, it takes a very long time to clear out everything. There's a few more of these creatures. Um, one of these creatures has like a turret on its back, the poison turret which we saw earlier on its back, which I found quite frustrating and annoying because you can't really easily damage them, and it feels like they're just reusing that whole poison gimmick again. But other than that, this whole initial section, the Sanctum City section, is pretty cool. 
and a pretty good beginning of the DLC. Next we have the Dragon Sanctum, which is where you go to and you progress to after beating the uh, Sanctum City. So you you cross a bridge and go inside, almost like this old, it's almost like a tomb in a way it feels like. Uh, and in here you have one of the enemies I said was frustrating, which is these invisible enemies. They're almost ghosts and you have to go and find their bodies and smash them because otherwise you can't actually damage them properly. They're invisible and your attacks just go through them. Which I find frustrating because they're just attacking you and you just got to run. Like, I don't like that. I find that frustrating. Like, there's nothing you can do to defend yourself. They're just going to be constantly attacking you and you got to just run from them. There's also a few traps here, a few areas you can fall down, spikes on the floor which come up. Pretty interesting ideas and pretty interesting gimmicks. But I think it's just a bit frustrating overall having those enemies which I don't really like. There's also two bosses here as well one of them is alana the squalid queen which is a boss fight i don't really like it looks pretty cool it looks like there's a skyrim wall behind her which is a pretty cool set piece and her moves are pretty interesting she can spawn some skeletons to fight alongside her which is a pretty decent idea but then she spawns in velstat she literally spawns in an entire other boss to defend her which uh what that just feels a bit weird but I played it a bit like Ornstein and Smo, so I was running away from both of them, waiting for certain times and chances to attack Alana, just completely ignoring Velstat and focusing on Alana, so just waiting for Velstat to do a move, dodging that move, and then attacking Alana, because she tends to play a bit more passive and a bit more defensive once uh, she's got Velstat out. So she's sort of giving you a bit of time to, to breathe and a bit of room to deal with Velstat. So she's just occasionally doing a move here and there, but she's a bit more defensive, so... I found that dodging Velstat and then focusing on her during that period was the best way to deal with her. After this, we have Sin the Slumbering Dragon. I don't like Sin. I have to say, people like Sin. I don't like him. He absolutely kills the durability on your weapons, and he doesn't have as much health as the Ancient Dragon. He just has this really strong like armor skin, and he can deal durability damage again, which is something Dark Souls 2 keeps doing pushing this durability damage so things break your weapons i don't like that it, it shouldn't even be something that, that factors into anything like i have a massive sword i like i've upgraded it 10 times spent the whole game buffing it up and then it just breaks super easy and then i'm gonna go and use a partisan you know it's just it's not very good if i want to commit to a certain playstyle i should be able to commit to that playstyle and not have a weapon break and not have to constantly buy repair powders as well. I don't like that either. So, but his moves are okay. I beat him first go again. A lot of people say he's really tough. He is actually tough. It's just, I think I just got lucky to be honest. But he's a pretty decent fight. What isn't a decent fight though is the Cave of the Dead and the Gank Squad. So, the Cave of the Dead is the optional area of this DLC, the first DLC. There's three DLCs and three optional co-op areas. The developers have said these areas were built for co-op play. So they were built for sort of you and your friends to go and take out this area and take out these boss. The problem is, you know, when people play solo, it's still the same difficulty. It's just as hard, except now you're doing it on your own. The Cave of the Dead, I personally thought, is the easiest of the three co-op challenges. The area is frustrating, but you can get through it. There's a lot of things which are sort of like there's a turret there shooting poison at you, and then there's an enemy there. So whilst you're defeating the enemy, the poison turret shooting at you, and then if you go for the poison turret first, the enemy comes and attacks you. Lots of things like that, where the line of sights of these turrets are crossing over as well to protect each other, and it's a bit frustrating. But I managed to clear the area out without much of a problem, really, unlike one of the later areas. Then, the boss of this area is called the Gang Squad by the community. It is three NPC characters, um, and you have to beat them all at the same time, which is very frustrating. But the, the best way to do it is to sort of run in circles, which is like, run, like get a, a loop, and then keep running around that big loop, and then have them all run after you and then slowly wait for an opening where one of them is separated from the other two, and then attack that one. It takes a bit of time, it took about 10-15 minutes for me to do it, but it's the best and safest strategy and the best way to deal with all three of them at once. So that's what I did, and it wasn't really too difficult, it just took a while. 
Um, the only problem is one of them is a ranged, ranged fighter, so the best thing to do there is run the other two around, and then when there's a bit of distance between you and the other two, then focus on the one that's doing the range attacks. And it, it's not really too much trouble. One of them's Havel, though, because they use Havel again for some reason, um, which can get frustrating just with that massive poise, and then you can attack them, and it does just they don't even move, they don't stagger or anything. And then they just keep attacking you and whacking you with a dragon tooth, which is frustrating, but it's not too bad, it's not terrible. Next, I'm going to speak about the game's length. Um, this is something that's never really been... Uh, I've never really thought about really much with other games, but Dark Souls 2, I feel like... I don't think it's a very controversial thing, really, to say that Dark Souls 2 is just too long. It's a very good example of quantity being a priority instead of quality. The developers said that for them, the game just kept sprawling out more and more as they were making it. But I think this was a bad thing, and allowing this to happen was a mistake. With the exception of the Forest of Fallen Giants, the Lost Bastille and Drang Lake Castle, no area really feels like it's been fleshed out and has a good concept and executes on it in a very satisfying way. I think Iron Keep probably comes close, but that doesn't really mean it's a good area. Many people have said this, but I have to agree by saying the DLC areas really would have boosted the game. If maybe you took out Brightstone Cove Saldora and replaced it with Shora, the Sanctum City, what I was just talking about, it would really boost that section of the game. Then maybe take out Harvest Valley and Iron Keep and replace it with Broom Tower or something like that. These areas and how vast and sprawling they are and well designed they are would boost some of the weaker parts of the game because this game does just go on and on. But it doesn't feel like it has quality in many of these later areas. The Shrine of Amana then connects to the Undead Crypt, but both of these areas are very short and very linear, and are nothing in comparison to even some of Dark Souls 1's weaker areas, like the Duke's Archives or even Sen's Fortress. Both of those areas are relatively short as well, if you just go through them quickly, but they have vast amounts of secrets, loads of hidden items, and awesome shortcuts that connect back to earlier parts of the level because of fantastic level design, whereas Dark Souls 2 is just about running from one area to another, which is one of its biggest weaknesses. I really think instead of focusing on quantity, they should have focused on having less areas, but made them more fleshed out, with more secrets, optional content, and more shortcuts. And maybe, as I said, use some of the DLC areas in the right days for that, and put them into the base game, instead of some of the smaller, shorter, weaker, linear areas. So next, I'm going to talk about Broom Tower. This area is all about a gimmick, um, but we'll get to that in a second. First of all, it looks awesome, I have to say. It looks really beautiful when you first look at it. The massive towers, it's a great view. It really does look awesome. It's got good world design, level design, a great vertical layout this area does that keeps connecting back to itself, which is really cool. But I don't like the gimmick with this area. Uh, the gimmick of this area is you've got these smelter wedges, and you have these almost like these weird creatures which give certain enemies around them a specific ability. They can boost their damage, boost their health, do a variety of things, make them endlessly respawn. And the idea is you have to get a smelter wedge, put it in to these creatures, which then deactivates them and stops that effect from taking place. Okay? It sounds like a good idea on paper. And to be honest, many people have praised this idea and like it. I don't. I don't like anything that sort of can make enemies just become an absolute sponge. I don't like it. I find it very frustrating when enemies just have absolutely loads of health. You spend absolutely ages defeating them, your weapon feels like it's doing nothing to them. It doesn't make a very satisfying gameplay. Especially in Dark Souls 2, where the whole game usually has lots of enemies which are attacking you at once, and you've got to try and deal with having a variety of enemies attacking you at the same time. I find it frustrating and I just don't really think it makes a very enjoyable gameplay. A lot of the enemies here are annoying as well. You've got this one big giant, which has lava, which damages you if you even get close to it. 
which I find frustrating because if it moves around in certain ways, the lava goes on you and you take damage. There's this one pit which you can fall into where there's just about 20 enemies, one of these smelter wedge enemies and a massive giant and loads of small hollow enemies all attacking you at the same time. And there's a ladder to get out, which, you know, if you good luck going up there while well, there's all those enemies attacking you. There's a lever you got to pull to open a door. Um, whilst all these enemies are here, because uh, defeating all these enemies is very frustrating and ridiculously challenging. Like, it, it, the thing is, it's not just challenging, it's more frustrating. It doesn't feel like Dark Souls 1, where, like, it's carefully designed enemies in certain places. It just feels like they put absolutely loads of enemies down here and said, ha, screw you, player, good luck beating all these in one go. I don't like it. It feels like difficulty for the sake of difficulty and not really carefully designed enemies in certain places that feel like it's actually, you know, put there to be a good challenge for you to overcome and feel good when you overcome it. I find it more frustrating than anything, but the level design here is good, as I said, and I like the gimmick that the whole tower is off at first, and then when you turn it on, it allows you access to different areas when the tower is actually powered, and then it gives you access to the boss fight at the end. And I'm going to talk about the boss fights now, because the boss fights are probably the best part of this, but first I'm going to talk about the Fume Knight, because he's the boss of actual Broom Tower proper. The Fume Knight is the boss that you reach when you get to the end and the very bottom of Broom Tower. He is absolutely awesome. Now, he has four Smelter Wedges outside his boss arena, which give him extra health. So the first thing you want to do is make sure you use Smelter Wedges to deactivate those things, and then it's a fair fight. There's a bonfire right next to him, which is great. No annoying enemies to attack every time you go to the fog door. There's one giant which pops up, but by the time he's coming after you you're already through the fog gate anyway the fume knight is dark souls 2 at its best i absolutely love this fight it is by far the greatest fight in the entire game it harkens back to artorias in many ways except i would argue this guy might be a bit more difficult but my experience with artorias helped me a lot in this fight um he does buff up about halfway through and his sword sort of goes on fire and starts dealing more damage he's not like artorias because with artorias when he buffs up, you can stop him buffing up, which gives you a good opportunity to attack him. And with the Fume Knight, he just buffs up and then he deals more damage and his, his attacks have a wider radius. He does have a couple of bullshit hitboxes, which is something I'm not the biggest fan of, but they're few and far between. And I think it's more of an issue with Dark Souls 2 as a whole, really, so I'm not going to really criticize the Fume Knight for that. This boss fight is the highlight of Dark Souls 2, the highlight of the DLC, and it makes this whole area, for me personally, worth it because i think that's what makes the area good really is this boss fight this boss fight is by far the greatest thing in this entire dlc not like the blue smelter demon on the way down to the fume knight you, there's a little optional path you can go down called the iron passage um this is an absolute joke and i think this is where Dark Souls 2 feels weird to me. Broom Tower, I don't like it. A lot of people do like it, and so I'm going to cut it some slack. People say that the level design here is good, the enemies are good, it's a fun or a hard but fair challenge. Okay, I don't feel the same, but if people say that, I will, I'm willing to say maybe this area just isn't for me. The Iron Passage, though, is just the epitome of every bad aspect of Dark Souls 2 combined into one area. Here we have a long passageway with loads of enemies. Enemies you can't get to because they're up on a ledge and they slow you down and then cast spells at you. Whilst you've got loads of other enemies attacking you at the same time. A massive run. You have to go through all of this every single time you want to fight the boss of the Iron Passage. Three massive sections when there's about... Two enemies shooting things down at you, one enemy slowing you down, about five enemies all attacking you at the same time. you got to go through one area of that, and then another area of that, and then another area of that. And at the bottom, before you get to the boss fight, there's one of those massive giants with lava coming out of it as well. And that's just to get to the boss fight, and the boss fight is a reused boss from earlier in the game. This is the blue smelter demon. It's the smelter demon... Except this smelter demon has bigger hitboxes, which are much more bullshit and impossible to dodge. He has slightly delayed attacks, which are delayed just enough 
to make you, if you dodge the initial attack, you'll get hit because the delay on the attack means that you dodged at the wrong time. And he has more health, he deals more damage, and it's just stupid because this guy's blue and the other one's red, and it's just reused bars with a different colour. It feels almost insulting, to be honest. This is just the absolute worst boss in the entire game in terms of that. It just feels cheap. Like, okay, there's, there's bosses that are worse. Okay, like Pride Omegas and Congregation are worse. But this just feels cheap. And that's the thing. It just feels stupid and cheap. They copied a boss and just changed the colour and gave more health and slightly delayed attacks. I just find it annoying and insulting, really. And you have to run through the entire area for every single chance. To beat him this again it feels like the game's just laughing at you it does it deliberately to piss you off i know this is supposed to be again a cop challenge it's supposed to be one of the cop challenges but i don't care i don't care it feels like it's hard for the sake of being hard annoying and just yeah i don't want to talk about it anymore next you have the memory of the old iron king which i think people like this area the boss is good the run-up ruins it for me. Uh, I think the run-up to the boss is just like the Iron Passage. Absolutely loads of enemies all over the place. Fire Salamander shooting fireballs at you whilst you got loads of the Alon Knights which are coming to attack you. And there's two sections of this, but they've got more enemies than the ones in the Iron Passage. So there's about, i say about eight or nine enemies in the first room, maybe ten. And then the second room has about six enemies, but some are lower down. So you only have to run past about three on the higher level. But the first room is the worst one because you've got about three fire salamanders shooting fireballs at you. Four, actually. Four fire salamanders shooting fireballs at you, I think. While she got to try and run through this. It's stupid. It's annoying. Which is a real shame because the boss here is actually fantastic. The boss here is Sir Alon. And this is a great fight as well. He has a katana, which was great for me because I was running an Uchi katana. Um, no, actually, I was running a black steel katana for this, actually. So it felt really cool. It felt like we were both using the same weapon. A proper jaw. And the problem is running through all of that for every single attempt because this boss is difficult. He's similar difficulty to Fume Knight, I feel like. He is, but it's not too hard, but he's hard, you know. And it's a great fight. It feels awesome, but the problem is running through that every single time. Again, it massively ruins it for me because it's just, it brings it to the point of frustration. You're like, oh, I just want to get another go at that boss. So you're going to try and run past those enemies, but then you run past them, you get shot in the face with three fireballs and then stabbed in the back. And then you get even more pissed off. And then by the time you get to the boss fight, you're pissed off because you died several times trying to run back to the boss fight. And it just, it makes it frustrating for me. This is the absolute worst of Dark Souls 2, this here. If you have a boss fight like that, which is awesome, but hard, it's a great challenge, it feels awesome. You don't want to have this massive run-up to it because it takes away from that. It takes away from that boss. If you spent so much time working on an amazing boss with great music, it feels awesome, it's a great culmination of some parts of the story which are really cool. You don't want to tarnish it by having this massive annoying run-up which feels unfair. It just takes away from it massively. Next, we're going to move on to the next DLC, which is Frozen Elium Lois. Um, Frozen Elium Lois is a... A lot of people seem to say it's the weakest of the three DLCs. I feel like, personally, Broom Tower is the weakest of the three DLCs, but Broom Tower does look better visually, and it has better bosses. This here, in terms of the level, I think the level is better than Broom Tower. Um, it's a decent idea where the whole area is frozen. And first of all, you've got to go through the frozen area to be able to find an eye to allow you to see a boss, which is Arva the King's pet, which is invisible. So you have to go through the frozen part of the level to then be able to find an eye which allows you to fight the boss, which is guarding the Grand Cathedral. And then once you've gone to the Grand Cathedral, then it unfreezes the whole area, and then you've got to explore the area again, except now it's not frozen, and there's new things there, new enemies there, and the world's a little bit different. I like the concept, it's pretty cool. The boss as well, the first boss, Arva the King's Pet, is a pretty cool boss. It's a good boss, I'd say. It's like Sif, it's, more, it's almost like the Royal Rat Authority was trying to be Sif, but this boss here is Sif. This is a much better... This, is, this feels almost on the level of Sif. It's a much better fight. It's a harder fight, but it feels hard but fair. It's got some decent attacks, which are pretty cool to dodge. It's satisfying dodging the attacks. 
And I think it's a good fight. It's a good fight. Unlike the one in the Frigid Outskirts, which is annoying. But this is a good fight here. The level as well is pretty good. It's got some great level design, some great shortcuts here, which I really like bringing back shortcuts full force here. I really like that. There were some really cool parts where I thought, oh, that's where I am. Oh, okay. I'm here, and earlier I was there. And these areas connect to each other. I really like that. Finding the night is pretty cool as well, because there's some pretty cool secret areas. You think, oh, that's where that is. Oh, and then now that that's where that is. And I like that. I, I like this section of the game. This frozen ice DLC is really cool. Then, once you've found three knights that are hidden in frozen Ilium Lois, you can then properly go to the Grand Cathedral to take on the boss. Um, so the idea is that there's a boss here called the Burnt Ivory King, but to get to fight the boss, you have to go through this sort of war section where there's four bad black knights, and then you initially have one knight to help you fight against these four knights. Um, well, they keep respawning, actually. There's about 20 in total, I think of the knights first of all you have uh, one knight helping you you have to go through the frozen alien lights to find the other knights which are sort of hidden they have i don't know they're not ready to fight or they're waiting for the right time to fight you gotta go and find them recruit them to sort of join your army and then you can fight the birds i freaking when you've got these other knights helping you out which is really cool otherwise the boss is just annoying um and there's too many of these other knights that are fighting you whilst trying to fight the birds ivory king the initial section where you've got to try and fight the other black knights which are coming in not actual black knights from dark souls one but they are just knights that are black um the initial section fighting those is a very cool spectacle but if you get stuck on the boss like i did and you die a few times then you have to keep redoing that initial section over and over again for another chance to fight the burnt ivory king and the problem is is that i for me personally i felt like i never really even when i beat the burnt ivory king i didn't properly master his attacks because every time i was going through that initial section i was so focused on that initial section that then by the time the burnt ivory king came i was like oh okay i already drained some resources and then i i don't know i didn't feel like i ever properly truly mastered the fight because of that initial section. I don't know, I didn't get a chance to really master it. It took a bit longer than I needed to really for me. And it takes a lot of time as well. Getting through that initial section takes about five minutes every time, which brings up the total time of the boss. And I think it's a bit, I don't know, but the fight's good, the fight's good. I wouldn't say it's great. You know, the Fume Knight is better. The Sir Alon is better. I'd say Arthur the King's Pet is probably better. This feels like another, it feels like just another sword and shield opponent here and i think this is where i think this is probably the only time where for me i was thinking like the other bosses in the game they had something more to them this guy just feels like another sword and shield guy you know the fume knight was pretty cool it felt like a badass it was a really cool fight this one just is like uh i don't know doesn't really have enough going from really enough unique things about his movesets unique story really much i don't know so i just feel like this guy's a bit meh anyway then we have the frigid outskirts which is the last area before we get to the conclusion of dark souls 2 the frigid outskirts is the optional cob area of this dlc the frozen dlc this is the frigid outskirts this is the worst boss run in the history of dark souls just hands down um here well no, to be fair i think that some of the other ones might be harder the problem here is okay the frigid outskirts it's a massive snowstorm that you have to go through and in the snowstorm like, it's pretty cool running through the snowstorm i will say because you don't know where you're going you feel completely lost and there's some buildings and structures that are out in this snowstorm which you can see and they're there to sort of try and help you position yourself so you know where you're going it's a cool idea. It actually is a very cool idea. The problem is these horses that run at you in the snow. Because they appear out of nowhere, charge at you, knock you to the ground. It's very difficult to dodge their charger, we'll say. And then you have to fight about three or four of them every time you want to get to another attempt at the boss. And every time you're going to try and run through the whole snowstorm again, go past these horses again every single time you want to try the boss fight again which gets very frustrating, which is the reason why I just used the NPC summons, because it was really annoying me. I just wanted to try and get the boss over and done with so I didn't have to go through that over and over again. It's a similar thing to Sir Alon for me, where the run-up makes you want to rush through the boss and just try and get through it. 
So for me, it was similar to Sorolan. I was like, I just want to use NPC characters just to get through this because it's frustrating me having to do this run up every time just for another chance at the boss. Which I just find frustrating and it makes you want to get past the boss. Because it's a different thing. Like when I beat the Fume Knight, I was like, ah, oh, yes, that was awesome. I feel satisfied. I'm like, yes, that was a great boss. I really enjoy that boss. And it almost makes you want to do it again. But then the Iron Passage, Cave of the Dead, and the Frigid Outskirts, and Memory of the Old Lion King as well with Sir Alon. Afterwards, I'm like, thank God I've beaten that boss because now I don't have to do that annoying run up again. And I don't want to redo it again because I'd have to go through that annoying run up every single time again. Which is why I just think the bonfires should just be outside of bosses, to be honest, because it just makes them better. <laughs> it just means, it just, it's not as frustrating. Luckily, Dark Souls 3 and Elden Ring sort of get rid of that. Um, for the most part, with a couple of notable exceptions, for the most part, boss runs are eliminated from the Souls series in those games. Anyway, the boss fight, I don't actually really talk about the boss fight. The boss fight is Ludenzal. It's two Arva the King's Pet. So Arva the King's Pet was the boss to get to the Grand Cathedral slash the Old Chaos. And then Ludenzal is two clones of that, basically. you got to fight two of them here at the same time. They do have slightly different attacks, and one of them buffs up and starts regenerating their health when they get to about a quarter health left, if the other one's dead. Um, the boss is okay. Uh, it feels like the enemies, though, Luckily, you just have to fight one at the beginning, and the other one joins after you know after the other one's about half health. It's they're okay. I don't feel like they're balanced properly for having to fight two at once, but they're not terrible. You know, it's a decent idea. It's it's mainly the run up which which brings this boss down for me personally. Anyway, now we're going to talk about the Throne of Want, which is the final area of Dark Souls 2 where you get to the conclusion of the game. The Throne of Want is an area, it's just a path. There's no enemies on the path. You just walk down a path to the final, the final boss, which is, first of all, you have to fight the Throne Watcher and Defender, which is almost like a Hornstein and Smell fight from Dark Souls 1. You have the one who has one moveset, the other one which has a more of a slower moveset. So one's faster, one's slower. They complement each other quite nicely. This is one of the best fights in the game, I think. But it's just that I never really... I feel like I beat them too easy again. They were a little bit too easy. So I never really properly learned their moves or saw all their moves because I beat them too quickly. But they're a good fight. From what I've experienced, I beat them once on the regular game and once on New Game Plus. They're a pretty good fight. I enjoy them. And they're not too difficult. They're not too easy. They're a pretty good challenge and they're pretty cool visually as well. Then, after you've beaten Throne Watcher and Defender, you go on to the second boss fight immediately. Uh, luckily, once you beat Throne Watcher and Defender, if you die fighting the next boss, you just have to fight the next boss, the second boss. Which is Nishandra. Nishandra that we saw earlier when we were in Dragon Lake Castle. She looked more like a human there. But now she looks like a creature with like a scythe. And she inflicts curse constantly on you. Curse constantly builds up all the time. When you're close to her or when you're close to certain pillars that she spawns. Which you can smash and defeat. And break them. Which means they won't break, well, they won't build up curses as much. But she doesn't have much health really again. And if you just use about 3 or 4 life gems constantly. Whilst your health is being drained then because you drained your health as well then it constantly counters that health drain and you can just sort of tank her hits and just try and that's how i did it i just i got cursed a few times used a few life gems and then just tanked her as much as possible and generally i beat her pretty quickly then after you've beaten the chandra if you have the scholar of the first sin edition and you beat vendrick and spoke to aldia then you fight aldia here Aldia, Scholar of the First Sin. He's a very, very, very easy fight. Almost just too easy. It's a bit disappointing, really, because he looks cool visually. But the problem is with him is that he has these decent attacks, like fire can spawn around him, which means you can't damage him for certain periods. Uh, periods. He shoots fireballs at you. But the problem is, is that a lot of the time he's just standing there, and you can get loads of hits in. If you get, if you try and get a bit too greedy, he can punish you a lot by having fire, fire spawn around him. But that's never really a factor because you just usually you can beat him before that even happens, really, on a regular playthrough. On New Game Plus, he was a little bit harder, but not really too much harder, really. 
Then after this, you get two choices. Here, you can proceed to the throne and take the throne. After you defeat defeated Nashandra or Aldir as well, a cutscene plays which shows the player walking on top of certain stone golems, which create a bridge for you to cross into a throne room. In this ending, you accept your part in the cycle of the world and take the throne. Doing so means you either sacrifice yourself to link the flame or allow the flame to continue to fade and become the Dark Lord, but you never actually see what your character does. Then after this, the other choice, which is only available in the Scholar of the First Sin version of the game, is you can leave. You can choose to leave. Uh, this ending only is available after you've defeated Vendrick and have spoken to Aldir at every bonfire, and then you defeat Aldir. Uh, after you've defeated him, both endings are available to the player. You can do either one, and you can choose to exit the throne and walk back through the fog wall. In this ending, you reject the throne, and you instead walk away. The actual outcome of this decision is never really known what actually happens afterwards. But you get a bit of nice commentary from Aldia talking over the ending, which sort of makes it look hopeful, which is quite interesting, really. So then, in conclusion, Dark Souls 2 is very much a mixed bag for me, really. Sure, it's considerably better than other games that are out there on the market, but for the standards to which I hold a From Software title, it's definitely the poorest entry. The combat mechanics and feel of the game just don't feel right no matter what, and it's too slow and too sluggish. The game attempts to ambush you and just outright feels hostile at many points, where it feels like the developers just want to piss you off, whereas the original Dark Souls and Demon Souls before it were challenging but still fair. Also, Dark Souls 2 feels like it doesn't quite understand why the Souls games are hard. They aren't difficult to piss you off. They aren't difficult to frustrate you. They are hard so that you feel accomplished when you overcome the obstacles that the game throws at you. The scene at the beginning of the game when the fire keepers tell you how you're going to die over and over again and lose all your souls is a perfect example of how Dark Souls 2 just misses the point. The fire keepers are almost sadistically mocking you, which is in direct contrast with the tone of the original game. The level and world design is a massive step down from the original title as well, as well as the character quests that you can complete. There were some other cool innovations like the Covenant of Champions, Bonfire Aesthetics, Power Stancing, and other improvements to PvP, but overall, the game is just a step down from what came before. For me though, the main thing I just can't get past is the game's feel. It doesn't feel right when you're moving your character and navigating through the world. The combat is not satisfying, the world doesn't flow together seamlessly, and it feels like it's all been patched together, and that's because it was. There are moments where the game starts to feel like what came before, like the Fume Knight boss fight and navigating throughout frozen Elium Lois, but when the combat systems and fundamentals of the gameplay are so poor, it's hard to ever really look past that. And for me, Dark Souls 2 is the only game in the entire franchise that has such a clunky gameplay feeling that I can't look past. So for me, it is without a doubt the weakest entry in From Software's catalogue. So then, that's the end of this video. Also, as well, you could potentially support me by becoming a member if you want to and get exclusive benefits, like shouts out in the videos and potentially play with me, and all sorts of cool stuff. Shout out to T Mortz as well, who is my first channel member. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to check out my full playthroughs of the games, which I talk about and narrate as I play through the games. They're on the channel, my entire playthrough of Demon's Souls, Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 2. Also check out my critical analysis of Demon's Souls and Dark Souls 1, if you haven't already. But other than that, if you enjoyed this video, make sure you like, comment and subscribe. Maybe even share this video with anyone you think might enjoy it, if you feel it was good enough. Thank you again for watching. This is Soul Reborn, signing out. Have a good one.